Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the program. I am your host, Chris George Zuger, and across the desk for me is my co-host, Big Sexy Alex. Say hello, Big Sexy. <laughs> hello, Big Sexy. We call it Big Sexy because the ladies love them. You have entered the den of lore. Please do grab yourselves your glasses of scotch and pull your chair up to the fire because we are going to learn some cool shit tonight courtesy of one Mr. John Cadman, whom we have been eager to have on the show. Uh, this is episode 34. Uh, this is the 20 f- 21st of April 2017, and we are knee deep, arm deep, up to the elbow in Science Month. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much uh, for all for tuning in, and uh, we've got uh, the guys uh, uh, who are waiting on the line, um, and uh, we just cut out their sound, so just to make sure that the intro is nice and crisp and clear for all of you ladies and gentlemen out there. So um, we also uh, would like to encourage you all to check out our Twitter page at Den of Lore. Uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, TuneIn, whichever. And also, if you do like the content that we bring to you every single week, you can now support us uh, via PayPal monthly or via one-time donation at uh, denoflore.com forward slash support, or you can become a Patreon and uh, get some cool swag that way. Uh, you'll get some high quality uh, Feel free to MP3s. send us a bottle of scotch or, in the or mail. You can, or you can send us a bottle of scotch in the mail, although a $50 donation would uh, do just as well. And, uh, you know, just to be able to thank some of our donors, uh, Danny Kerr, thank you very much for the uh, bottle of scotch slash uh, uh, paying for internet this month. Much appreciated. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. He's been listening to the show for six weeks or so. Uh, in addition to that, uh, for our Patreon uh, patrons, uh, one is uh, Vinice from uh, Magical Egypt, and the other is another guest of ours, uh, Mr. Uh, Doug Keenan. So uh, thank you. And as well, I do also have one new uh, patron, one new uh, donor, I should say, which I'd like to personally thank. If I can just find it in the email. One second here. This is what happens when I get 50 emails in a week or in a day. <laughs> it's good. It's oh, it busy. is good. It is good. Uh, nope, that is not it. You know, I, I know I got it. Son of a gun. I'm going to thank you by the end of the show, and I do apologize because it was a one dollar donation, but still, one dollar does go a long way, and uh, and all of that good stuff. And with our music coming to a close never get these in here so i'm just gonna quickly switch out to our in-studio cam ladies and gentlemen welcome to the program um i'm hoping and one thing that i learned a couple of weeks ago is to always 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 double check the chat because if our darned technology doesn't work and there's no sound for whatever reason i want to know about it so i need to make sure that i can talk to all of you late lovely ladies and gentlemen as we go and just make sure we've got that going on here. So how is that? Audio fixed in Bellington. Thank, thank goodness. Okay, so um, it's good to know that we've got at least some sound going. And welcome to the program. Um, I'm going to welcome our guests onto the air. Gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Now, before we start, I know that we always like to be able to include our guests in our opening segment. And we do have a very funny, interesting opening segment for uh, for you all today. Now, as you may or may not know, uh, I get a lot of emails from fans and from just people in general. Uh, sometimes it is just a lot of spam, and I'm just seeing all of the emails just to currently update. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Oh, and a special thanks to Ellen Chin, uh, who uh, sent us a donation uh, via PayPal today. Uh, uh, Ellen, uh, your uh, uh, contribution keeps us on the air, keeps us in scotch, and keeps us nice and limber, in addition to paying the lights and paying the electricity and the internet. We pay the show out of our own pocket, so making sure that uh, we do not have to have interruptions such as ads or, uh, you know, the like on air, or have to put our stuff behind a paywall, uh, your contribution goes a long way, so, um, and what a time. So, yes, I got an email uh, from, I think it was Wednesday, and I think I sent this to you. And, uh, I, you know, normally we do very, very heartfelt and heartwarming emails, but this was just too damned funny. And this is from a Miss Vera, and she writes, Dearest, 
I know this mail will come to you as a surprise, since we haven't known or come across each other before, considering the fact that I sourced your email contact through the internet in search of trusted person, person, who can assist me. My name is Miss Vera Warlord, Ibrahim Kolobali. <clears throat> I am the only child of my late father, late chief, Sergeant <laughs> Warlord, Ibrahim Kolobali, a.k.a. General Ib. It's like, hey, Ib, how's it going? That's... Great name. Uh, my late father was a well-known Ivory Coast militia leader. He died on Thursday, 28th, April 2011, following a fight with the Republican forces of Ivory Coast, or otherwise known as the FRCI. Now, I didn't fact check this, so I have to double check this. If anybody out there can, can look for this, this would be fantastic. You can read more about my father in the link below. There's actually a link, so I'm going to give you all this link in the chat. One second here. Our poor fans are going to be... Now, no, no, it's are not Are going to be yet. inheriting millions of dollars. It's, 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 it's not over yet. Oh, crap. <clears throat> Once, I'll just, I'll just cut out the sound for you. I am 24 year old, 24 years. Now, keep in mind, 24 in years is not, is not um, uh, separate. Old female from the Republic of Ivory Coast, West Africa. I am writing this mail, mail, to call for your collaboration in a partnership business in your country. I'm constrained to con contact you because of the mistreatment I am receiving from my stepmother. Oh, there's always an evil stepmother in this she shit. She slaps her on the wrist Just when she's writing email. Fucking Cinderella. With a, with a, Miss, Miss Warlord Cinderella. With a tusk of ivory. <laughs> with a tusk of ivory. <laughs> <clears throat> um, where was I? Uh, she planned to take away all my late father's treasury and properties from me since the unexpected death of my beloved father. My father secretly deposited the sum of U.S. Now get this shit. $4.85 billion in one of bank in Burkina Faso. Now, Bur Fa Burkina Faso, and I keep on the Faso is actually in lowercase, so I think that's misspelled. With my name as the next of kin. However, I shall forward you the width, with, I shall forward you to with the necessary information of the deposit on confirmation of your acceptance to assist me for the transfer uh, uh, and investment of the fund in your country. I will give you my pictures and details about me in my next mail. Period. Please, all communications should uh, be go through this email address, which is uh, missvera110 at gmail.com for all of you who want to get that $4.85 billion. anyone's looking for billions of dollars. Exactly. For confidential purposes. Well, fuck. We fuck need to me. talk to this woman. She's going to... Well, exactly. Well, here's the thing. And, and uh, you're sincerely Miss Vera. We, we could funnel that. We could launder that money through the that's, Den of Lore show, right? Well, I'm, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm thinking here. Um, now, uh, you know, there's... Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of ethical things we have to worry about with regards to Miss Vera and this money. Um, now, first of all, there is also the fact is that if she's offering us like four point eight five billion, imagine what her stepmother would offer us if we told her that this shit was going down. So, uh, Miss Vera, I'm terribly sorry to to have to uh, be the bearer of bad news, but I'm going to sell you out to uh, the Burkina Faso feds, and uh, you know, I think. Uh, I, I think that um, I think that I'll get some good, better rewards from your evil stepmother. So, kalukale, as it were. Uh, yes. So that was that was basically the that, that was basically the email I received. What, uh, gentle, gentlemen? What are your thoughts? Should should, should we should we launder launder that money that four point eight five billion dollars? I'd want to meet her first. Well, she's a Burkina Faso. That might be quite hard. You'll have to go there then. Okay. <laughs> so much ivory. <clears throat> now, ladies and gentlemen. Um, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Which African currency is this? Because that could be way less money. Uh, I'm not too sure, bit rate. Uh, Let's check out Forex first. Make sure it's not like $10 of some sort of fiat currency. <laughs> well, it's it's probably in, it's in US dollars. So, of course, <laughs> it's in fiat currency. Um, now, Just think like 100 years from, from now, you'll get one of these, but it'll be like. My evil stepmother wants to, to keep uh, six billion cryptocurrency coins. Well, there you go. Um, <clears throat> now, though, I'm, I noticed that there is going to be there, there that there is some chop in the uh, in the video, and I do apologize for the ladies and gentlemen um, for that. Uh, let me just see here. I'm trying to. I'm gonna have to, gonna have to fix fix up the bit, bit rate for that. So unfortunately, there is not. So while I'm looking for that information. Um, uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let, let's get, um, John Cadman on there. Now, uh, John, uh, I wasn't able to find much of a bio f 
for you. So I, I cobbled uh, together that. Uh, let's see what I got here for you. Uh, John Cadman is a writer and researcher who in, in work embodies a theory that suggests that the Great Pyramid of Giza is a subterranean chamber, water pump, and pulse generator. And you can also check out uh, his links uh, as well as his YouTube channel. But the, that is all in the show notes. So, John, how are you doing today? Uh, it's a great day out in uh, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest. So, good day. Good day, eh? Good day. Just up next up, <laughs> Vancouver. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but, right. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to quickly just reset the um, uh, reset the feed just so I can up the bit rate so we can actually get some better frame rate going here. So give me one second here, guys. <clears throat> so Chris would have to ac actually give up his computer seat in order for somebody else to do this. They'd have to jockey his whole hard drive system. There we go. It's, uh, it's no small feat. Okay, I think I've got better frame rate. There we go, finally. That's yeah, it's a little bit better, I think. Uh, now, see, the, the ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize. I, I messed up uh, setting up the bit rate, so when, once we started streaming, I couldn't actually stop. And uh, we're trying to stream in 1080p. It's not exactly the greatest right now, so it's probably going to be a little bit choppy. If anybody knows how to be able to fix this while we're in chat, please do let me know. Um, so, uh, uh, John, please do tell us a little bit about yourself, if, if you're, that is possible. Well, my background really is was uh, as an engineer up on, on crab boats in Alaska. So it was the Bering Sea, King Crab Fisheries. Uh, spent a number of years up there. Uh, did that to pay to go to Western Washington University as uh, so taking engineering there. And so most of the pe uh, kids in this neck of the woods anyways, go up north to Alaska to help pay for tuition. So learned, ended up doing that for a living for a number of years, uh, learned the, the trade and how to make things actually work and what, what sort of fluid dynamics are required for all sorts of machines every, anyway, from any different types of pump, uh, anywhere from centrifugal pumps to gear pumps and, and also worked on refrigeration equipment up there. And so there's different types of pumps and pressures on those also. So, so that's kind of my background and how I know how a lot of things actually work in real life is uh, actual application and fixing things. Broke a lot of things. And how, how and, sorry, go ahead. And then um, I've also always been interested in off-grid sort of living situations. That's always fascinated me ever since I was small. And uh, there was a period when I was going to school down in Los Angeles, of all places. Uh, but it was by the beach, down by Playa del Rey. So it was cool at the time, uh, but still wanted to be up in the woods of uh, either this area or up in Alaska, kind of living um, off grid sort of situations. So I learned a lot about, you know, alternative energies and uh, more self-sufficient type setups. Um, and that kind of led to looking at the pumps or the, that theory, which Originally, it wasn't mine. I, I'd stumbled across it uh, in Richard Noon's. <laughs> everybody knows Richard Noon's book, 55000 if they're around. Uh, it was a very popular book right before the end of the millennia, one of those doomsday prophecy books, uh, which was pretty much at most bookstores. Was, and kind of in that book itself, uh, he, Richard Noon, it's actually a really good book. It's a thing. It just has uh, the 2% of the doomsday uh, planetary alignment, gravitational shifts of, of uh, the date of uh, 5 5 2000, which didn't seem to affect much of anything, since obviously 
Uh, but the book itself was excellent. Uh, it covered everything from ancient Egypt to uh, especially the the pyramids. A lot of technical how to in it, I guess. Very much technical how tos, but it also covered more of the histories and covered things such as Peter Tompkins' works. Uh, cannot think of the names, but. It was his was one of the most extensive books on the, the Great Pyramid itself, Secrets of the Great Pyramid. So it had a lot of his works and then had uh, Napoleon's adventures into, into Egypt and all their all of uh, their expeditions, uh, I guess. writing and documenting. Excuse me? Uh, the expeditions or? Yes. Yes, because he was there for... I think about four years, and they documented as much as possible all of Egyptian antiquities. So covered that and the histories of the Great Pyramid, and also covered things such as the Templars and their histories, and just a pretty much all the ancient civilizations that had disappeared. So that's kind of where. I found the book actually fascinating besides that doomsday nonsense stuff, which it's a nice selling headline. Um, but part of what was in the back of the book towards the end, which he actually added, I think in about 1988, he added some research which he'd come across, which was a fellow named Edward Kunkel. Now, Edward Kunkel was back from back in the turn of the era, the, the Depression era of the 1920s, 1930s, uh, engineer type, also businessman, and he made a bet. He made a, made a bet with uh, one of his belt buddies that he could figure out how the pyramids were built. Oh, that's like, oh. You know, uh, give, give, give me two seconds. Like, oh. uh, give, give, give it two seconds. I have to stop the feed again because I'm just going to try one more thing okay. here to... Okay, let me just pick the phone here. Not a problem. That was good. That was good. <clears throat> book. That's an excellent one. Indispensable. Absolutely. Between Tompkins and also... Tompkins is excellent. Um, Noons is absolutely exceptional. It's surprisingly good. Uh, I actually used it quite extensively for cross-referencing things such as the, especially the sub-chamber, because there's so many errors. Whereas the upper chambers, they're to the millimeter. The sub-chamber, other than the descending passage, is a giant jumble of numeric mess. At least, it was a challenge. Now, if if you were up north, how how did you first get into, uh, you know, the your your overall, say, interest in Egypt? Like, what what was the the major kind of jump between the two? Yeah, where's the connection between Alaska and, <laughs> and the pyramid? Obviously, the pump connection, but there's no connection. Nothing. There's just okay. no connection. I was just fascinated with the. Once I started delving into the actual engineering that was accomplished, and seeing the engineering pr principles, then it became fascinating. So that, I think the connection is just the engineering of of large scale, uh, indestructible items, of machines. So I guess that's the connection. But so where he we, we chatted about the pyramids once before, and I had made a bunch of comments about uh, you know what would the what kind of pressures would we be dealing with here? You know, we uh, have chatted with some people speculating that it was a there's a chemical reaction at here for these chambers, and then if it's a pump, then how are those measurements relevant to pump dynamics? Okay, the the subterranean chamber itself has a shaft that. Uh, it's 330 foot long. It's approximately four foot square. Extremely straight. 
but it went from the exterior, the entrance door, down under, underneath the, the core of the Great Pyramid, and that was 100 feet below the bedrock and directly below the uh, central axis. Mm -hmm. The, the pyramid would not be functioning at atmospheric pressure? It would be like a pressure vessel if it's a pump? or Well, originally the pump itself, I, I wanted to make it because uh, Edward Kunkel had said that, said that he had built parts of it and he came up with two different theories. Is the thing. He came up with one which he described as the construction pump. And that was just the lower half. And a lot of that assembly made sense. Um, described some sort of vortex. Uh, Where would be the evidence for the downstream of the pump? So say if the pump's driving a giant irrigation system, uh, you know, is there any... Where would the Where is the outlet on the pyramid for it being a pump? How does this uh, theory work? Now, his, what he said, and it made no sense to me, was that it had an output up at the upper parts of the pyramid with uh, lambskin sort of pipes that went out into the desert, which seemed absolutely ridiculous, like a giant sprinkler. Uh, <laughs> okay. But a lot of, a lot of what he, he came up with actually made sense uh, as far as vortex-assisted hydraulic ram pump. Uh, it was incomplete, his description, and I, so I made a model back in 1999. So it's like a vertical so, scroll compressor for water? Vertical scroll compressor like for You're water. saying there's like a vortex like coming up through the pyramid? As far as I know, the interior structure of the pyramid uh, wouldn't be accommodating for a spiral pattern. If you were say pushing water through it or something i don't like it's all square construction for the interior piping systems so you'd lose a lot of your centrifugal force through the square resistance factor on the pipes potentially i'm theorizing here but <laughs> I, i'm following uh no it didn't actually pump water into the pyramid itself uh very little that's that was the conclusion is that the water pumping action wasn't actually to pump water because there was already a giant lake that was uh, inland and and there's tunnels and pipes, etc., all all over the plateau and other evidence strongly pointed to an older era of construction when they didn't need the irrig irrigation anyways. It was, uh, pre-flood pre and pre-ice age. Hmm. Now, so that it was redundant. It was redundant. Okay, now, how, how did you stumble upon the idea that it was a water pump? Like, what was the source of your, um, like, of, of your journey? My source was just re seeing Edward Kunkel's sketches and description. And then, and then the, you have to have a need. And the need was going off-grid where there's, you know, there's no power and needed to do some irrigation and had a, had a water source but needed to transfer water over a distance, over, you know, say a thousand feet with a, somewhat of a, a drop of the water, so the head. So that's, the, that's where the need is and that's where actually forces the pump to be constructed. Interesting. Um, I'm thinking there's so like uh, the, some people were talking about it as a potential grain silo. So if they saw like the Ice Age was coming 10,000 years ago, then they had 300 years to build this pyramid. So if you were using it as a grain silo, then and the world was going to flood, you'd want to put a sump pump system in the bottom of your grain silo so it wouldn't all rot out the grain. Uh, I'm just trying to interconnect multiple theories here in terms of you know, why did they build the pyramid? What's the function? What are the proofs of the function? Um, any any insights on connecting some of those dots? Or <laughs> well, th this is kind of one of the things I've always kind of wondered, you know, w with regards to this this type of theory, because we we've had the monoatomic gold theory, we've had 
this is our third water pump show in the space of about a month, just because it's such a, a, a wide, vast um, uh, subject. Now, the big thing for me is the idea that it is you know that the 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 king's chamber had uh, like was some type of resonance structure um so you know if, if we're connecting multiple theories i would say start from the beginning as far as your process uh from you know recognizing the building as a pump like what is the first part the second part the third part uh, like deconstruct it for I'd, us. I'd love to see somebody take the interior volume of the empty space inside the pyramid they say well okay there's you know 45 stories worth of head pressure there's this volume of empty space in the pyramid that we know about what would be the volumetric capacity of water if this is a water pump and what would be the head pressure on the system? Uh, maybe that's uh, why they built the pyramids. Well, th- that's th- that's t- several steps ahead of like the, the idea of the water pump is okay. Well, how, how did the entire thing, like how does the machine work? How, how did you start construction for, for your own model um, against what is actually in the internals? And how, if you can explain that, from you know from a from an expert engineer standpoint my vision and how i determined the construction i actually went first had to determine some sort of scale and i with a lot of the shafts being there's a four foot shaft and a three foot shaft and a two foot shaft all these square shafts i'm going to have to replicate them then I need to obviously need to do some sort of scale which will go along with that. And so I did a quarter inch to the foot. Um, that gives you a, the four foot, a one inch square shaft, and then three foot, a three quarter inch, and the two is a half inch. So when you start with a scale that you can actually use and build, at that point, you can start to do a build and uh, start replicating. So that was how I started, this first scale. And then uh, the next thing was to actually do a scale of the subterranean chamber itself. And the subterranean chamber is 27 feet by 46 feet. And so I think it's like seven inches by 11 inch square model, by about five inches deep. I, I commend so you on actually amazing. building a scale down model. That's uh, much uh, further it, than most people go. Everybody else is a fail. <laughs> Everyone else <Okay>. is a fail. <laughs> I, I, I almost cannot ex- ex- explain or put enough exclamation points beyond that. So it's other people's stuff is garbage. Okay. Um, now, if if. Like for instance, uh, Daniel Alexander here in, U- in YouTube chat is asking yeah. if it's burning hydrogen and hydrogen implodes, creating a vacuum, which would draw water upward. The steam would condense and flow back down, potentially to be used for drinking uh, and irrigation. Is that's that... conical stuff. I'm I'm sorry. That's conical stuff, and it's a mess. Okay. Is you only get 32. Um, a vacuum will only elevate 32 feet. So. Okay. And Chris Dunn explain that massively so now it's w- just old stuff from 2000 okay now uh, uh, alex what was your question originally from like after as far as pressure was concerned that would be well if it was a pump then you know, what kind of head pressures what kind of volumetric calculations sure. the world uh, sure, you know, there's aspiring young engineers out there who want to build a scaled down model for themselves you know, where would they start uh, how does this begin <laughs> study to be? John's work? He's got an eight scale working. Yeah, well, it's, just making conversation. To tell us about yeah, the model, the, I guess. I guess the main thing is is it's going to have to you have to build something that's really indestructible, and that's a lot of where the you know the Bering Sea King Crab engineer stuff came in. Is everything there you have to make indestructible? You actually have to know how to make shit. <laughs> Like a lot of people are just talkers and they don't actually know how things actually work. Um, so that's where kind of the background comes from. So when I made it, I doing the quarter inch to the foot, I started with, if you're going to do a one inch square pipe, you have to oversize it for, is you're going to have drag and you don't want to undersize the pipe. So I went with an inch and a quarter PVC, which is uh, on that 
drive shaft because it's only about four foot of drop to it and four foot of drop uh, four times a uh, point is 0.42 pounds per foot now that's only 1.6 uh, pounds of pressure at that elevation so that's the head pressure which is minimal so I use schedule just standard schedule 40 inch and a quarter uh, which is rated for 480 PSI I think that was more than enough. So I used that for the drive pipe, the descending passage, which is a 330 foot pipe. So that's where I started. And then the next thing was to build the actual subchamber and build it out of uh, some sort of material that seemed like it would hold the pressure. Uh, and uh, try to replicate as much of it, the interior as possible. Just a step, there's fins, there's uh, all sorts of hydraulic features within it. So that was the next, that was actually a huge challenge because there's so many errors and so many people's sketches and it's very incomplete. Uh, so that was the next challenge. The first one I actually made out of cement blocks, cinder blocks with uh, epoxy and, and the like. And, and made that back in uh, 1999, and that thing, uh, it completely fractured. It, it failed. So, so then I actually had a, a mold, and once you, I made a rubber mold so I could actually make an epoxy fiberglass one, overlay one. So that was the next model be built, and that was a fail also from pressures that I did not anticipate. Um, plus, it was, I realized at that time, back in 1999, that the shafts were the wrong way out. There was incomplete shafts and missing outputs. And so then I, have to, I had to get topographical maps, which were hard at the time. Didn't have Google Earth, which is really nice now. So I had to actually figure out where various outputs would be for the wastegate and uh, probably the biggest error that Edward Kunkel made which was a huge problem for me was that he kept saying that the subterranean chamber would ut utilize an air cushion which is really standard in hydraulic ram pumps and that it just use a vortex and some sort of pressure to compress the air down the subterranean chamber and then it reversed the water and go back up. The air was a problem. And that took me another six months to figure out that the subterranean chamber actually should have zero air. And so I had to redesign the model and actually match what, what uh, earlier explorers had said was in that location, in the locations. Did you get cavitation in your model or something? Or I, I think there's cavitation in my model itself because I, I get gases coming out of the, the wastegate line, and I could hear a, uh, it sounds like cavitation mid, mid line, uh, going to the wastegate. John, uh, do you think that cavitation explains the erosion that's seen in the subchamber? The cavitation, indirectly, indirectly it does. Now, the, the way the pumps actually runs, it actually uh, has a, a valve down in front of the Sphinx area. It's 2,000 feet away, uh, which slams shut instantaneously with the water flow. And it creates a, a shock wave. Uh, water hammer was a common name but it causes a compression wave, and it also creates a rarefaction wave. Now, the compression wave itself, on my model, which is you know, pretty small scale, I get no less, absolute minimum of 120 PSI spike. Um, and I'm thinking it's closer to 300 PSI spike because I break uh, parts that are rated for 400, 480 PSI. 
Uh, so if it, you translate it just through scale, then the pyramid itself would be a, no less than 330 pounds uh, PSI output. So it's, you know, it, that's enough for irrigation or whatever ridiculous stuff you want to do because it's kind of redundant. Um, so with, okay, with the, with the compression wave, that shock wave, you've got a shock wave right after the shock wave within water, within fluids, hydraulic pressures, you get a shock wave and then you get a rarefaction wave, which is equal and opposite to this high pressure spike. So you got an extremely low pressure rarefaction following this up this line. And when it goes up the line and then it reflects on a, a, a 45 degree plane surface down at the bottom of the pit and shoots up to the ceiling, the, rarefact the compression wave hits the ceiling rock and sends a shock wave up through to the king's chamber and queen's chamber to resonate them. I've got recordings of that. Um, but right after that, that, this is where the erosion actually comes from, is the rarefaction wave. Because the rarefaction wave is a low pressure, um, extreme low pressure uh, shock or anti-shock that actually pulls, it chips away from the ceiling. And if you look at the ceiling, that's exactly what you see. And you'll see it in, um, they use it for offshore oil drilling rigs. They uh, use it for um, mining. For uh, They use the hydraulic pulse generators in mining and offshore oil drilling rigs for exactly that. Um, same, it uses the same names, the hydraulic pulse generator. Uh, so it's definitely seen. There's, it's not, there's not a question because it, with, it, with it being limestone, you've got layers and it was a, the old coral reef bedrock. And so it actually chipped downwards. And so the ceiling above the pit actually has uh, erosion from that or chipping from it. So that would definitely send shock waves up into the pyramid itself. Um, I have in the model, I actually put an isolated the GoPro um, on top of the rock above the pit and then recorded the shock wave, which, which actually would go through the subchamber, through the water. And now this is just shock wave through the water. It's not the pipe. This is completely isolated from the pipe. So it's just the shock wave going through the water and then transferring up through the ceiling. And then I put a, a GoPro which was isolated to record the, uh, the shock waves to try to get some sort of frequency of what this would cause just in this model. Okay. And in, in your model, I, I know we've, we've heard from, from Doug on the, the possibility of, uh, you know, for, I think it was episode 20, uh, 30 or 31 uh, with regards to his um, idea that it was used to image the solar system. Uh, what is your position on the on what that shockwave was used for? Uh, it was used to to uh, resonate the king's chamber, queen's chamber. Now, then you get a couple different directions on that. Okay, I've I've seen about three for sure, and I think Doug seems to be kind of like the next step past Chris Dunn's, it kind of, it adds to it. Because Chris Dunn's really the, the godfather of all the upper chamber uh, being a machine. I mean, absolutely. So that's where I got my vision that there was actually uh, some sort of pulse coming from the, uh, the sub chamber. And you, you so, say yeah. it's like a subwoofer, right? That's that was my my holy shit moment. It's like, oh my god, it's a subwoofer. Well, I can relate. Uh, um, the pyramid when I uh, made a huge bang in the Grand Gallery, it was right around like I say subwoofer frequencies. You know, uh, my 
my ear would tell me that it was around 50 hertz. I didn't record that because I was right in front yes. of guard. I think it's 51 hertz. The Pharaohs yeah. used to like to drop the bass. That's what Joe Parr came up with. <clears throat> Joe, uh, Joe Parr came it, up with 51 hertz. Uh, and he sent me a recorder to record it. Yeah, that that sounds bang on. A very fuzzy bass frequency in it, and it uh, it resonated uh, for for seconds after I did the bang. So so essentially, what you're saying is that the the pharaohs were you know anti diluvian uh, speaker freakers, ra- ravers basically. Like what? Oh, what, what oh, it's like oh, it's the oh, biggest uh, subwoofer on you know, the planet. Get get get, <laughs> get some get, get some reeds. Make some you know like some some ancient glow sticks. You know, eat, eat some you of that. Want, uh, you want to hear what it sounds like? Sure, sure, go for it. Let's see if I can pull this off. Uh, I just have a lot of things up on my so hang tough. One second. Someone's going to remix the pyramid bass noises here. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put, I'm going to turn this up. It's uh, just a speaker system. Hopefully there won't be feedback. Make sure it works. Okay, this is the the higher frequencies. Now I'm adding the mid range. We, we can't hear anything. We can't hear anything. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Here, sort like of like a, a thumping heartbeat or something. Like that. <laughs> That's awesome. It's actually making his screen shake. I think I know that Nine Inch Nails track. <laughs> so that's actually what it sound like up, up in the uh, the rock, up into the, up into the uh, king's chamber. So that, that audio recording came from when and where? That came from a. I just put a GoPro right back on top of the rock, the ceiling of the sub chamber, with it running, and uh, just isolated so there's no outside sounds like the water or the valve shutting, and uh, that's all it is. So that's actually actual recording. So it sounded like that would be up in the king's chamber. That's not, and that's not uh, amplified. It's actually it's loud. <clears throat> Subtle. Well, for, for something for something that large, I would assume that it would be loud. Like you're, you know, you're, you're talking about something sixty-three be, stories tall. It would ring the earth. You would be able to. You'd have seismic. Be able to find it anywhere on the planet. There's zero doubt. Yeah, stone is a natural amplifier too. Uh, if you were to pick the pyramid up, even just a few inches, you know, cut it, slice it at the base, and hit it, it wouldn't be very loud. If you set it down on the ground and then struck it, so if uh, if this pulse hit the bottom of the pyramid, all that rock carried that uh, sound and amplified it. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, John, I know that we've we've got some uh, some graphical. Uh, Sure. Resources that uh, that you want to be able to take us through, and I know that there's there's sure. quite, quite a few of them. So uh, no, knowing that we can sometimes well, go three or four hours. I'll... Was there one other audio clip to before we jump into that? Or oh, was there? I I have another one. Uh, it's not quite as good, but you can actually tune the water pressure to create a heartbeat pulse, uh, which is let, let, quite an anomaly. Let's let's give it a go if you can play it there. Just before we jump into the slides, that would be nice. Let's just do the slides, and I'll see if I can find it. I'll just walk through it. I have to remember where I've stored it in all my videos. Sure. Okay, then we get to check out the slideshow. Oh, there, okay. Oh, there we go. It, it'll make sense. The slideshow just oh, shows. See, that, that's that's kind of the problem. One second here. Uh, let me just check the main port audio. Oh, right screen. Hopefully, this works. One. Two, one. Nope, wrong one. Thank you, OBS, for being completely useless. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see what I am seeing. Okay. Share a screen. Like this. There we go. I'll just do next, next, next. 
<clears throat> okay, so this, this is the first image. Okay. This is from Stephen Mailer's book. Uh, oh my God, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, anyways, it's, it shows that the Fayum Oasis at this time, um, that was the ancient Lake Morris, and that's actually a depression, and it has a, a channel that ran over to the Nile River. So it actually filled it up, and the Nile River was, was dammed back in a, not that distant history. So that's the water source. And then in the upper right-hand corner, you can see some cities such as Cairo and, and Giza. And so it's not a big distance for an, an underground uh, pipe system to go over to the uh, water feeds. Okay, now, so that's the water source. Now, b besides the uh, underground caverns that are at Giza, have, have they found any proof of, uh, or evidence, I should say not proof, but evidence that could potentially lead to an underground uh, water cavern system? That goes up oh that God, far? yeah. Underground cavern system, they're everywhere. Well, uh, okay, that, that goes up that far to, let's say, Car uh, you know, to, to Karnak. Has anybody mapped the aquifers <laughs> with, like, a LiDAR system or anything like that that you know of? I, I don't know. Personally. Okay. Okay. So, so let's go on to the next okay, one. Okay, let's go next. Next one. I'm going to be hitting Command-9 quite a lot on this. There we go. So we got a 10-second lag on him watching it off YouTube. Well, okay. You, uh, if you, if you uh, uh, John, if you just look at the Skype, the Skype window, I actually have my screen sharing with you, so you don't even need to look at, uh, okay. at the YouTube feed. Okay. I'll get there. Okay. Hey, there it is. There we okay. Go. Now this is just current. Just looking at um, Ky uh, Giza and Cairo, you can see it marked in the corner, uh, right next to the delta, that giant delta. But you can also see where the Nile River is uh, in proximity. And when they made the pyramids themselves. That Nile Delta was not there. The water level of the planet was lower by 500 feet. And so it was actually at the northeast corner of Africa. And, and you can see uh, where that, that Fayum Oasis, the ancient Lake Morris, is on the, just looking at Google Earth. Okay, next one. Now circle, the next one circles in stuff. Okay, slide three. Slide three. Okay, that actually shows you know, Morris circled, and you can see you can see the channel to it. So that's there's no, you know, no guesswork about this stuff. This is actually just shows this is Google Earth essentially. It's Google Earth. Okay. So it's blatantly obvious, and and the Nile ran until I think it was a uh, sixty-five, I believe, when the, uh, the I would, pretty sure it was the Russians made the dam. Uh, for uh, hydroelectricity there. Oh, those damn Russians. As, they, <laughs> as, as some people in the it's States It's all their fault. I'm just telling you. No. <laughs> I, I, I love the Russians myself. Well, you know, I, you know I, I'm Croatian. We've, I we've love uh, Well, you know, if, 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 you like, if you like, I've got friends who love vodka, and, you know, they, they've got some very good borscht. It's uh, good food, good food, good music. Uh, it, it's a I mean, sloppy they, thing. They, they created a great a great uh, breed of dogs too. Oh, so. this is also true. Now, uh, so slide four. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, Oriental Institute's yeah. picture, but it, on this one, the Great Pyramids on the right, and then the Capron or the middle one, and then whatever the small one's name is, Khafre. Uh, but it, you can actually see the elevation how and how it had a causeway that went down to where the Nile is, and that's the, where the Nile River is, or was. Um, so the causeway was just an actually an overflow for the the moat system around the pyramid itself. And all pyramids have, have walled structures around them, and tunnels to them. This is just gravity feed system. 
with a overflow for to assure that it gets enough water. So you got to have more than enough. Okay, next one. Slide five. Okay. Now this is uh, looking down, and it's a topographical map. So I just filled in where the where the Nile River would be. So it just shows how close it actually is to the Nile. And the Sphinx is down uh, below the middle uh, middle ones uh, a monument causeway. So it's only two thousand feet away from the river. Okay, next one. This is slide six. Oriental Institute, and like these guys, they're very conservative. Uh, it's out of Chicago. But this is their graphic, and they show the wall structures around them. You know, just so having a moat or a wall around them, there's no no issue. I don't have to. I don't have to make it up. How's that? Okay. Now. Okay. Next one. A quick question before we move on to the next one. Uh, those th the, the three smaller pyramids in front. What would those have served a purpose for it with regards to the larger, you know, the the um, uh, pyramid of Giza? Seems to be some sort of frequency tuning, or it has something to do with frequencies, and I, you know, I don't know. I have to kind of base mid focus high. On. <laughs> Can I throw one out there? Go, go, go for it. Um, the shadow they project on the Great Pyramid tells you the position of the sun. Basically, the center one and the the center one always projects its shadow, and the other two, the shadows appear. So at different times of the year, you'll see either all three of them outlined, and then the shadow will start to shift until you don't. Um, so it's a way of day by day tracking the motion of the sun by looking at the now, were they originally that way? I don't know if these are dynastic constructions because you could do the same thing with an obelisk in its place. Maybe they're just marking it, but I'm just going to throw that one out there. That's very clever. I hadn't seen that or heard it. Okay, so this is uh, slide one, two, three. So has anyone videoed or GoPro'd the underground canals that would have... Those pipes connecting yeah. the Nile? And then how old do you think the pyramid is, roughly? What kind of mental framework are you... It's just pre-flood. It's pre-flood. So okay. 10,000 BC, prior to that. So it existed at that time. Okay. And much of that has to do with other other remnants uh, that are consistent. Okay, so this is slide seven. Yeah. Are, are you still getting my uh, screen feed? I am not. I mean, I see it, but it, it didn't change. Okay. Now, this this one is also, it's a graphic that uh, Richard Noon had found, and it's from Howard Weiss's book, Pyramids of Giza. And the most significant thing of this uh, graphic is that it shows the well shaft, the charm, which is right in front of the, the door area. So that was the, the connection to the the old. And if you listen to uh, last Morris. week's show with uh, Scott Crichton, it's the only thing that uh, Vice did that was actually worth a damn because apparently he... I, I heard it, yeah. <laughs> he faked it. <laughs> it was a good show. It's like, I just want like, to go back in it time. It was a good show. Oh, well, I know. Like Scott went all out. I'm just like, I just want to like, go back in time 200 years and slap the taste out of his mouth. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, this is slide eight. I can see why he did it, but sure made a mess of stuff. I, I think it might be legit. But you, you I, yeah. Uh, um, if I built the pyramid, and my, you know, I would totally put my mark on it where no one would see it. And uh, there's red paint they found in the one queen chamber shaft. I sent that to a picture, uh, that picture to Doug last week. Well, you know, I, I will respectfully disagree, 
But um, uh, we respect your opinion on this show, and we thank you. I'm just for going pretty flat. <laughs> Even um, <laughs> I know, and I. <laughs> it's just it's it's neat, you know. If if uh, Mr. Vise was so you know such a straight shooter, and you know, then dude, uh, he bribed yeah, he his way into Parliament. What do you mean straight shooter? He's more crooked than than. Oh, some... okay, I don't know. <laughs> oh, jeez. Than, than British teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is this is slide eight. Uh, t- t- yeah, it's one, just a. Two, three, four, it's from the Oriental Institute. It's a wireframe, okay. so it just yes. kind of shows the cross. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the internal proximity of the subchamber as to the causeway. Um, and then the that place. is a nice oh. graphic. Let me interject. Notice the position of the three smaller pyramids, and pretend you're the sunlight coming directly from the east. That's brilliant. I. I'm not a disagreeing. That's I never heard it. So, okay, so bravo. Next one is slide nine. Now, uh, did John just just be able to confirm? Are are you looking at the Skype, um, uh, the Skype feed, or are you uh, looking at YouTube? Shit. I'm sorry. Because yeah, Switch Skype feed. Skype's gonna be a, a, a you know about twenty thirty seconds behind, whereas the, okay. the, the Skype will be like almost instantaneous. YouTube will be twenty seconds behind. Yeah, was a, Skype I was a fail instant. on that. Okay, this is also this shows well, just old old picture of the uh, pyramids. But the best part of that is actually looking down at the bottom of the graphic, and it shows uh, the. The elevation of the Mediterranean and the Nile, and all that, with uh, correlation to the where the subterranean chamber is. So you can actually figure out where shafts are going to be from that. That's absolutely brilliant. That graphic is key. Okay, that's uh, okay. Actually, the bottom of that, and then the next. Graphic will actually show. This is slide ten. Towards it. See now this. Now I'm, the next few graphics are going to be close-ups of the various parts of this, which are are critical. Okay, the red arrow points to the, the elevation of the subchamber, with regards to the Nile and the floodplains, and Mediterranean. So that that gives you some elevations um, relative. And then right above it, that's uh, obviously a satellite image. And what I did on that, I overlaid, I did a you know XYZ axis and dropped it 100 feet below the bedrock to drop exactly where the pit of the subchamber is. And the, the pit of the subchamber is angled at 45 degrees. And that is angled for the shaft that goes out to that circled area which is right in front of the Sphinx itself. Um, you can go to the next picture. It'll, S- pop, it'll zoom in on that. Slide 11. Oh, son of a gun. Oh, no. Oh, that's going to that's gonna suck. It's going to open up Photoshop on me there. I have to cancel that. Is that your backyard? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <clears throat> no, this is my desktop, which is basically the equivalent of me dropping my drawers. So, let's see if I can make a you know nice little happy face for everybody here while this is going on. Da da da. Come on. Preview. Is preview open? There we go. So this is slide one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which we were just on. This is slide 11. Okay, okay, now that's zoomed in, in that satellite image. And what I wrote there is absolutely critical, is they did find, and I think it was 1980, um, documented by the Egyptian Water Department. They were drilling to check the water tables, and they hit rose quartz granite at uh, 30 feet below the surface, and they told it exactly where it is. So, rose quartz granite does not belong there, so that was, you're going to give a very good uh, proximity to the elevation of the output shaft. That'd be below the Nile. So, oh. you 
Okay, you're getting. That's a giant clue. Okay, now what? That's what, what I, uh, the the way the shaft leaves the uh, sub chambers aimed uh, right in that direction. Okay, so basically the red arrow is the shafts, and that circle area yeah. is 100 feet east and 30 feet below the surface minimum level waste gate line. What is the significance of that? You need elevation. Where the water's coming out. Okay, the elbow sorry. aims there. Okay, so it's, it's find a start and an end point. We've got a start point, but you don't really know how deep the start point is. Um, because you're getting there will be. Uh, a mix of messages on how deep the shaft is because they didn't really dig it all out. It's so really that's, old. that's the output, basically. Yes. Okay. That's where the wastegate valve would be, the valve that makes the water hammer, the water shock. Okay. Now, we're, would... we're, we're going to need to go back into the, like, I know that there's probably diagrams within there here. There are. Later on. Okay. There so are. we'll be able to explain the, the that, uh, that, um, that concept later on. So this is slide yes. 12. Slide 12. Okay, now below the, the uh, causeway of the middle pyramid, there's a water shaft that shows exactly where it is. Uh, and there's a multi-room, three-level structure that has, is flooded uh, most of the time just from the, the water table, the water of the, uh, the Giza Plateau. Um, but the significance is that there is underneath all that, when you go down, there's a structure, there starts to be tunnels and structures at 100 feet below that spot. And that's also exactly where the delta shaft of the subterranean chamber is. So it, there's no way you can connect things other than you know, possibilities. You gotta go with some clues. You have to stretch a little bit, but that's not a huge stretch. You, know, you got to start in an end point. Okay, okay. go to the next one. Slide 13. Yeah, that was just a zoom, and it actually, if you zoom in, then you can actually see that it says mean level of Mediterranean Sea, and that arrow points right to this, uh, the subterranean chamber. So start to get elevations and topographicals. So I had to really replicate Giza Plateau on as far as the drops to get the correct hand pressures. Okay, now, so. if, if the subterranean chamber is supposed to be a... and it, Again, it, the subterranean chamber is supposed to be a vortex pump, essentially. Now, there's no... Uh, the vortex is, vortex is secondary. Okay, the vortex is secondary. Uh, is is it the source... There, being cool. Now, is the, is, the, is that subterranean chamber the, one of the sources of water? Or is it just there just to be able to drive drive the, the, the pump itself? It's there to drive the pyramid to okay. resonance. Okay. That, now, the secondary thing is I, I'm assuming because this is a, a very old drawing that um, the, like the, the depth is kind of, it, it's a guess. Like, it, it can't be that deep below the edge. Or is, is that fairly accurate? That's fairly accurate. It's really close. Okay. <clears throat> this is why I love doing these it types. Did, it did great. <laughs> well, this is why I love doing, doing these types did, of shows because I can ask these types of questions. So <laughs> this is and this was from from Richard Noon's five five two thousand. The book has a resource. You have to really look close on the pictures. This looks like Petri. <laughs> yes, but you had to find a re a resource before doing all the internet searches. Sure. Okay. And next great. slide. Next slide. All right. This is slide 15 or 14, actually. Oh, sorry. That's slide 14. And that ju that shows uh, the axis is extrapolated, and because the pyramid was an eight-sided building. Um, so I had to do the axis to get the exact location of the subterranean chamber's pit. Okay, now with, I'm trying to find a way to be able to rotate this very quickly, but Mac uh, preview is not exactly the greatest thing on the planet. So give me a second here. Uh, rot oh, I, okay, there we go. Ah, yeah. <laughs> rotate right. There we go. That's better. <laughs> Short keys, got a lot of Okay. <clears throat> For all of those who don't so want to turn their head sideways. And yeah, so that just is where I threw the axis in to get, to, you know, 
get really accurate locations instead of fudging things. Okay, now the, these points, the water shaft uh, entrance tunnel, uh, like that's, um, I'm going to probably estimate that as about four or 500 feet behind the Sphinx. Oop. Yes. Th that, like, th that's basically to the, the access tunnel, which leads from uh, uh, Confrace Pyramid to, the, to its causeway in this direction here, if you could follow my, my uh, uh, cursor, I'm guessing to its own uh, exit point, which is still within that same general area of, uh, you know, of, of um, the water dump, from what I can understand. Is that is that about right? That, that'd be close. Okay. Anybody's guess on a lot of it. Okay. I, it's hard to get the evidence because they covered up a lot of the evidence, which is a pain in the ass. Uh, let, me just, let me just make sure I've got these. Uh, only They're not my friends. <clears throat> Maybe they are my friends. I visit, you're my friends. Well, you're on the show, you're our friend. It's a, it's a... I, Zahi, I love you. I, I, I've never met the man, <laughs> but I just know he hates radar. And I'm a fan of radar. I don't know what he's got against radar. <clears throat> right. Okay. I'm not, not going to thrash. I'm going to go there someday. Slide 15. Okay, now this is... A, a really crappy graphic, but it does show what the what the uh, room structure is underneath the under that central uh, causeway. So it, there's three levels of rooms. There's the bottom one has oh it has a one of the, I think it has one of the granite boxes and some pillars that are have been eroded, and then it also has you can see they threw. Water shafts in. Okay. So and then later on, they deleted them. So I'm assuming there's probably water shafts somewhere in there. They, no, I'll make my graphic my graphic designer's interpretation because I, I speak pixelated. Uh, so the the blue blur of whatever the hell that is in the top right hand corner that that that's the causeway, and then you've yep. got uh, an exit, and then it drops down a little bit, and you've got this one. Um, you know, little blob of whatever it is that that's one room, and then it drops down again to the to the right, yeah. and that's another blob, which is another room. And those then, the the blobs of pixelated stuff are actually uh, there's some of the I not sure I think they're granite, so it's granite boxes. Yeah, there's a few. Okay, so are you are you, are you those saying, those down are, are you saying that 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 uh, cavern of those twenty like twenty five giant granite boxes that's connected to that? Yes. Oh. Holy shit. That's oh. that's mind blowing. Um, now what's uh, now that that one that bottom blob? If I'm not mistaken, there was a, a, a like a, in the '90s there was this one um, like uh, cavern of the Sphinx uh, show that Zahi had like gotten Fox in involved in, and they they went yeah. down behind or like below the Sphinx and like we found the the the, the chamber of a, like it was right. Osiris on Anubis, and it was like this. Coffin underground, and they had these, these four pillars. That's it. Right there. That's, that's it right that's there. It. Holy shit! Okay, so all four. So all it's a hundred, a hundred feet below the bedrock too, or it's the same elevation as the output of the dead dead end shafts, and you've got shafts. It's very strongly implied that get, connect to that uh, bottom room. Okay. Sometimes they leak the stuff out accidentally. I don't, I don't include it as being required. So, okay. Somebody so, else can find that out. Next slide. This is slide 16. Oh, I know this image. <laughs> this is, it's just a wonderful, really high res one. And on this one, this is really high res. You can actually zoom in and see little, little notations at various spots that you won't spot anywhere else that I've ever seen. Um, going down the shafts, it, uh, it, it talks about uh, oh. uh, indentations and, and the like. So, and now this one's very interesting when zoomed in. That was good, but the next one's really, really awesome in that Slide it shows. 16. And I, I put arrows to where, where the notations were and what they wrote. Okay. It's, a, it's in very small writing, and this was also in that book five five two thousand. But it's from the Edgar Brothers from nineteen twenty nine, and what they had discovered. 
I have to find my pictures actually to read it. Okay, so this is actually slide 17. It's it's the uh, Pereira's excavation, 36 feet deep, location of small recess. Uh, drawings by Edgar Brothers, circa 1929. Subterranean chamber and pit. Yes. So it's the cross section okay. and the top down. I'm, I'm looking. I'm, I got it. Okay, and then. Okay. Yeah, note, by the way, and the then, big sub chamber and then the small recess is the little one that is directly to right there next to it. Okay, so the, the small and, recess is this one right here on the right hand side? No, over to the left there, Chris. This is the small recess. Yeah, they're right there. Okay. Yeah, you can actually see it in the upper part from the side view. You can see it. Um, let me see here. The that recess, that passageway is going to the right north. There. So we're in the east looking west, and you can see that it's kind of this little outer hole. Okay. Well, what, what's the city? Before, before all the action starts in the subchamber. So, and what does the small so, recess do? Yeah. Well, I was just pointing out it says location of small recess. Um, I think that's the small recess that he's talking about and not the red arrow, which is another important oh, no, no, part that John's going to talk about. Yeah, the location of that small recess is okay. different. But then what you see in that upper upper half of the picture down into the pit, they actually wrote that they dug it down 37 feet further and right wrote who, who dug it down. Which I'm assuming is the, this where, where my cursor is right now that's in the top right-hand yeah. corner, which corresponds to this little like dinky looking thing coming on the bottom right hand corner um, it's straight down it's straight down from the subterranean chamber okay and it's very oh, small writing very small writing yeah well the, that's um yes okay and it says it well it, i don't it, have that crap you know, even even though the frame top right left here, okay. Pairing well, excavation. okay well top left here like I, i'm seeing that th this is a this is like the, the, this type of drawing is meant to be one to one, so it's different perspectives, but essentially they both line up. So, whatever is here yes. is essentially right here. Whatever is here is essentially right here. Now, I do have to I do have to point out to all the listeners and viewers at home that be thankful we actually did 1080p on this, not 720p, so you'll actually get a better view. You'll see what I'm actually seeing right here in the same resolution, even if we go to webcam and the the frame rate is shit. So, um, again, thank you for your patience, and you're welcome. I guess we'll go from there. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you. No, thank you. Anybody <laughs> doing good stuff is M mistakes can sometimes be good. Um, now, okay, this is slide seventeen. So let's go to slide eighteen. Ooh, that's even better. That's that's a lot more interesting. Let me just. Uh, okay. Th okay. Now that's actually where the book. That's a, a, a scan of the Edgar Brothers book itself. Somebody sent it to me from New Mexico area. And so you can actually see the subterranean chamber in, in, in the various uh, viewpoints. Orientation, so that's yeah. what I use. I use this one for a lot of the model, other than the fin sections wrong. Because it had, when they were in there, the Edgar brothers were in there, those fins were full of rubble that they had dug out of the pit itself. These people rolled rocks down that long descending passage you know fun time so they put them up in the fence okay and this is this was slide 19 so the next one would be slide 20. okay that's it just shows the alignments of the subterranean chamber at the very bottom with uh with the king's chamber that which is a rose quartz granite freestanding resonating chamber, most likely tuned. Okay, now here's a good question for you, and I know that we're probably going to be jumping ahead a couple of uh, uh, stages here, and, and I know that Alex is manning the YouTube chat, so I do apologize for all the listeners at home if you're trying to get oh, a hold of me. I, I am I, I'm, I'm, I am manning the uh, I'm manning the three monitors in, ahead of me. Now, I notice one very important thing, and again, I used to sell home theater systems. I know speakers you know, speakers were, were my life for a very long time. All oh, right. And I've got a very nice sound system. Oh my goodness. My, my, my wife, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're, um, looking at space in the house. My wife, my, my wife wants me to downsize our home theater system. I'm like, no, fuck that. Um, because downsize I, shoes then. Exactly. Speakers so, are equivalent to shoes. Exactly. So, uh, my whole understanding of speakers is that they have to be properly aligned, they have to be properly balanced, or else they're going to shake themselves apart. 
the pyramid, especially the Great Pyramid, the King's Chamber is not centered in the right. overall structure. Right. If it is going to be sending shockwaves upwards or amplifying those shockwaves that are coming from the subterranean chamber, the way that the entire pyramid is designed, it would shake itself apart the way that it is actually designed. As a subwoofer, it is not viable for long periods of time because it's just it's just not in the center. If I take a subwoofer and I take the cone, or like the, the center of the cone, and I move it, you know, uh, 30 degrees right and 30, like, uh, or thir you know, 30 points right, 30 points to the left, so that it's off center, it's, it's, it's going to, whenever a bass hits, it's going to work for a bit, but you're going to have... Um, disproportionate sound, you're going to have uh, disproportionate uh, resonance, and it's going to shake itself. The, the, the actual cone will shake itself apart. So how the hell is, it, with, all, w w with, with all of this engineering, how the hell did they account for that, and what is, um, like, w what's the purpose of it, if that's the case? Like basically, th think of a speaker. That's, that's a very valid question. Yeah. I, I've never heard that from anybody. Um, when I had when Chris Dunn visited in 2005, I also had uh, Dr. Jack Collet here, uh, who actually makes hydraulic pulse generators for, he designed them, he invented them for offshore oil drilling rigs. And he said it was a pulse generator. He was impressed. And the one thing, the one question he threw to me was also, can you imagine how loud it would have been within the king's chamber and they start talking about reflections off the outer surfaces and this is somebody that actually knows all this stuff yeah well, you, and i just knew it would be just incredibly loud and i'm the sub chamber guy i'm not the upper part so that's kind of what i built it would be loud your question's excellent no no for for Cole, he's um can you refresh me who could because the name is familiar I'm trying to think he might be the the inner ramp uh, pyramid guy so I could be wrong on Dr. that. Dr. Jack Belay? Yeah. No. He no. does he doesn't even like pyramids. Oh okay. No, he actually invents invented uh, industrial hydraulic pulse generation generate applications. This, see, this is the problem. <laughs> this is a problem running a show when, when, when you've got this many names that are being thrown at you on a constant basis and you know one one <clears throat> As one uh, Croatian name sounds like another when it comes to my family, <laughs> one French name can sound like another. So I do apologize, but still, that is. Um... The one, the one thing I was going to say is there is a slide further on which starts showing describing the pulses, which shows his design and his application, and it's absolutely parallel to what is at Giza. It's, it's perfectly parallel. Okay. Who, or analogous. Who, who was the hydraulic uh, pulse generator author? You just mentioned it. Uh, Jack Collet, K O L L E. Thank you. And okay. Just industrial designs. He's from Temp Tempris Tech down in uh, by Seattle. Okay. So, fr French French name from Seattle. Makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, like, so, so let's go on to they, slide twenty one. Oh, that's tw slide 21. Um, so, uh, picture, that was the best pictures I could find at the time of the sub chamber and showing some fins, showing that was uh, the top one is from Santa Faya, uh, Graham Hancock's wife. She did, that's a great picture of the sub chamber, the fins and the, and showing the step and the channel within the that uh, room, and you'd also see the chipping on the roof of, of the pit. Pit, of course, didn't always have a rail around it. Okay, now, now. now I, I'm going to take a question from YouTube chat because I realized I've got a phone with oh. uh, with a, with with <clears throat> the chat actually available on it. So again, thank you for all of all, all of your patience. Uh, here's a dumb question, okay. and this is Bye. from from uh, Juan uh, Pinizzi. Uh, here, yeah, I, th I think I pronounced oh, that right. I do it. So, so Juan, uh, Juan asks, if the pyramids were built in a time when the area was lush and green, why then the Nile's adoration? It wouldn't create today's type of oasis versus the desert's harshness. I 
Like a historical relevance, like yeah, why I build a pyramid if the if it was pre-flood. Okay. It's interesting pre- question. It's uh, we don't have weather data back from back then to prove that either, but. And uh, to uh, uh, DK Lean D, I'm just gonna call you DK. Uh, he uh, said that your heart is not in the center; it's a system; it's a resonance system. Okay. Um, and uh, again, I can understand where you're coming from. My whole thing is if the idea is that it's a giant subwoofer that, well. If if it's being used as a speaker, then you need to have everything aligned in the center, or it's going to shake itself apart. That's basic sound. That that's basic acoustics. So, I'm, I'm just going to say that's absolutely excellent. Nobody's ever said that. So well, this is what we call the den of lore. We bring together different, you know, disproportionate ideas to try and find the truth, as it were. And if you could hit me, absolutely, I'm all for it. Okay, so this is a slide twenty one, and we are looking at a. Uh, wow, that was loud. Do that out of the mic for you. <laughs> uh, so the, we we have two images. This is of what part of the chamber? This is not in the pyramid. This is probably, um, I'm guessing, in one of the subterranean chambers. I outside. So that's a, it, uh, outside, I let's see. I'm missing it somewhere. Okay, go go back to your Skype if you, if you're missing it. I'm still seeing the subterranean chamber. It's probably. I'm not seeing the image you're talking. Oh, that. Oh, I see your cursor on it. Okay. Yeah, that's the subchamber itself, and it has fins okay. and hydraulic fins. Okay. It's not. They're purposeful. Okay. So going on a slide. So I actually, so I actually replicated everything there, uh, as close as possible, to see what the machine did and what the flows were. Because I, whoever made it's genius. So I just replicated genius and that's actually on your facebook page if i'm not mistaken i actually saw that picture you're actually showing like a, a blue 3d printed or or machined version of this or at least one half of it anyway possibly again it could be wrong uh, uh, possibly hey, again i was doing some research before the show so i'll i'll bring that up uh, once once we get uh, things done here so that was slide 21 sure. moving on to slide 22 and that is Dr. R- Dr. Robert Shock. It's Shock. <laughs> you know, you know the reason I, I actually have that picture is is for scale. Uh, Shock is a tall struck, guy. Yeah, he's like six three or five or something. So you you get to know how far it is from that step to the ceiling, and then the fin. So that's just for scale. Um, thanks, Shock. I mean, his his stuff's really good. But I needed somebody I knew their height. So that's. Thank you. Good, good, this good shout out to uh, Doctor Shock. I know you're you're quite busy, and again, thank you very much for all your support and uh, for getting back to me. I will write you back as soon as I possibly can. So, uh, slide twenty three. That's I gotta keep going. I'm just gonna press the 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 space button because using the uh, <clears throat> using the mouse is not working too well. <laughs> okay, and that's actually. From Edward Kunkel's uh, The Pharaoh's Pump. And see, now, that's one of his graphics. And so that's how he he thought the subterranean chamber worked. And so I would have never even started on this project without Kunkel's work. Now, Kunkel has passed, I think it was back in 1988, is my guess. And uh, so I had to start somewhere. It, that you know, shout out. Uh, he was wrong about a ton of stuff, and he never made it worse. So I made it work because I had to. He did irrigation and and okay. So, so when you spend six months on a pyramid project and it doesn't work, you look like a giant fool to all your friends and family. So you got to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, that's the truth. Well, yeah, you, you had your own. Pyramid. Thanks for hanging in there, John. You, you had your your <laughs> Don Quixote moment. Trust me, I think I had the exact same thing starting up the show. Where I'm like, you know, the occasional friend is like, yeah, you, you know, like you make it like five views and that's it. And it's like seven months later, like, hey, we're we're doing pretty good, and we're we're talking to to John Cadman. I got like, you know, this is this has been awesome. So you know, the the idea is for all you kids at home, never give up, never surrender. And and the Good. most one of the interesting phenomena was actually that. I came up with the, the solution on December 31st, 1999. So it was the last hours of the millennia. 
which was uh it was a surprise i mean i just had an epiphany moment and just sketched it down go figure there okay go. go ahead so 25 okay now that's actually the description that's such a clue because nobody really says anything about that spot and that's from 1929 and it says you know the northwest corner of the rock cut subchamber the great pyramid of giza showing the small recess in the west wall and then also stanley looking over the thin ridge of rock which oh bounces the south side of the narrow stall like cutting in the north corner of the chamber so that there is that that cutout at the back of the uh, subterranean chamber and you can see the fins and, it, and so you get scale of the fins you get a, a spot that goes not only back further than everything it goes up and that's pay attention to clues so that's a clue that nobody talks about great clue that's from uh, 1929 Okay, and on to the next one, slide 26. So this is the model I made, and there's that small recess. There's the fins, and that's an old model, May of 2001. So, you know, it's a while back. And uh, you need the air removal line in that room. It's designed to have zero air, and when that chamber fills, because air would naturally go to the top and then it'd be stuck in there. Um, air circuit, there's a circulation that goes, all the air, uh, air and water circulates to that back spot. So it naturally removes it. It's a very complex uh, design. Okay, and uh, the, the image of the uh, man who seems to be coaxing the sperm to bend over? Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> okay. that's funny. That's, is, the image is called the water man. Okay. And, and Hakeem Iwan pointed that out extensively to Stephen Mailer, saying that was, that was the, the wise man who knew the secrets of the water, and he said it had to do with the pyramids. So that's, that was the image that I used for a kind of little tag. Okay. Way back. <laughs> that's 16 years old. Oh, shit, you're making me feel old. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it ran 17 years ago. <laughs> And it's so, running out. That's what. That's when I first learned how to DJ. I was actually I was running a. Uh, believe it or not, and this this is this is kind of like the the the, the far stretch for the uh, uh, synchronicity moment. Um, I was okay. actually running a DJ studio. I was learning how to DJ in a DJ studio <clears throat> of a city of Ottawa building, which was actually in the boiler room. So in the basement of a city of Ottawa building, which kind of oh, leads awesome. to the whole subterranean chamber thing. And now it's actually a uh, 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 like the Ottawa. Um, like Alex, what is what is it? We went there for for a conference there a couple of days ago or like weeks ago. It's a uh, incubator. Oh, the uh, innovation center. The innovation center. It's actually it's 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 actually Ottawa's innovation center. So like what what my DJ studio used to be, and trust me, like it was uh, like the old fifties type of boiler room. We built a studio like a, a ten by ten studio in one corner of it, but it was like old school boiler room, and. It was <laughs> no amenities, <laughs> no, 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 um, like no, no official status. We had to like, yeah, it was, uh, was, uh, it was pretty, um, pretty ghetto back then. But uh, still, you know, if, if, we're, if we're going down memory lane, that's kind of, that's kind of my contribution to that. That was a good one. That, that was good. The <laughs> boiler room would have uh, very interesting acoustics. Oh, we, Let's yeah. See. Oh, goodness. And there, there was not a, a, a place... Um, actually, we had residential um, about half a kilometer away, and, and the sound system we had in there, the residents from the rock in that area, uh, would actually yeah. still carry the sound that half kilometer. Like it was. Oh, absolutely. So, pretty wild. Yeah. So this is a slide twenty-eight ne coming up next. Yeah, sound tr shock waves travel through water like uh, electricity through wires. It's it's, it's, it's uh, excellent transmission. Now this, so, is, this is just my, my side profile, which uh, shows the other lines that I had added and where they went with that description, because those, those are not described anywhere. So that was my contribution. It's actually putting those on there. Okay, now, uh, 
David David Alexander uh, once again asks, um, and th- this is just kind of like your your opinion on it. Uh, what do you think about the potential of having a gold capstone, and what role do you think it would have played in the overall machine as you know the machine itself? Like, uh, thank you, Daniel. And th- thank you very much, Daniel. That's that's a good one. Um, I you know I I followed a lot of the energy from the vacuum uh, theories and series from John Bedini and. Tom Beard and and I I just getting a feeling that they used they used uh, some of that uh, you know grabbing energy from the vacuum that's also that's all Tesla's work so that's my gut feeling no proof no proof so gut feeling so no proof that's that's you know that's uh, infinite almost infinite energy source you have to use uh, uh, catch a bit of it. Huge amounts. Wow, that's awesome. It's just Tesla's later work after AC. AC was just nothing compared to that. That was the big stuff. Well, you know, if if Westinghouse business is always going to be business, but if Westinghouse had been a little bit less of a dick, maybe uh, we would have uh, actually been able to find out more about what he was talking about instead of him going into obscurity and kind of dying alone in a hotel room. So that's that's kind of what. The interesting of... thing is, John Bedini and Tom Beard, and actually, they're they were buddies. Uh, Bedini's dead, just last November, uh, but they really deciphered a lot of his works, and and Bedini made a lot of different devices, which which uh, touched into that uh, energy from the vacuum, and, and he did other ones, uh, magnetic systems. Brilliant. Okay, and the next one, slide 30. Dirty 30. Which seems to be the exact same thing as 29. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was... Oh, that was just showing the wastegate. It shows a little flap valve. And the other one showed a little poppet valve at the back of the room. Okay. The poppet valve would allow... Where would um, that be in the image? Where, where that, and that's where that, that look, Stanley, the little boy, was looking at the recess. That was that little poppet round ball valve okay so and the, that was the previous one the round ball valve uh, in 29 uh, okay yeah above, that one, that one yes. yeah the round ball valve so that, that was uh, above the um uh, above the subterranean chamber and then the pocket valve is out near the output line um yes okay that makes a little bit more sense i just yes. wanted to ma- i just want to make sure because for for everything that you sent right. me i'm going to be putting this up as a pdf for anybody who listens you know for for the tens of thousands of listeners at home uh, who listen to us uh, via MP3 so that they have an, a PDF companion to follow you'll, along? You'll be the you'll, you'll be the next Project Camelot. For what you mean, us? Sure. Or them? We're we're, we're the dental or sure. we're we're nobody else. We, we are our own. Well, show. I mean, I'm just saying the follow. <laughs> follow. Project Not, Camelot doesn't have a big sexy Not, Alex. <laughs> no. <laughs> Cherry's kind of out there a lot. There so. you go. <laughs> So the slide thirty one. I do it again. <laughs> Being okay, sexy. now this one, this was actually looking from the input shaft, the shaft that goes into the room. So you're looking as you walk into the subterranean chamber. Now, if water's flowing through the square shaft, what the the, cons- the one thing I was really trying to point out here is that whole left hand wall is one consistent plane. From the input to the output, that's where it's going to hit. Is where that X and also around that X, and that's the dead end shaft uh, or the output shaft. So it goes directly across the room, and then when water hits, when fluids hit a, a perpendicular surface, it, it, it fans. It doesn't bounce, and so it shows the fanning structure that actually gets proved later with uh, inkjet model. So it, you have to see that there's a consistency in logic to this machine. So they they have the square walls to ch- try to generate just like a straight up laminar flow of water and avoid turbulent effects or something. Or yes, yes. So I, I replicated parts of it with round pipe where it didn't make a difference. And then other parts I did the square pipes, where I I could see that it would make it, where it would just important. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So next one was slide 32. Okay, this is just, it's a graphic overlay, but it's from one of the 1929 pictures before they put the, all the bricks and the, and the, and the uh, handrails and stuff. So you actually, I did the yellow arrow that goes across the room to the, from the input shaft, the jet shaft, over to where the uh, dead end shaft output is. So you get to scale and then also get some of the water flows as best as possible without making it too messy. And it's, you know, it's hard to show. Now, what do you think of uh, Steve Meyer's idea that, uh, you know, his general consensus of anybody can put lines on a picture and call it a correlation? Anybody can do what? Anybody can put lines on a picture and, you know, and call it a correlation. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, anybody can put ink jets inside a model and actually run it and take pictures of, of the inkjet flow patterns and then put lines where the ink actually goes. So, uh, no, I, I, yeah, we're going to have to get, we'll, we'll, we'll get more on to, to Steven later on. I know that. Um, but, I uh, we're, we're going to have to get sorry, sorry, NVIDIA sorry. as I'm, a sponsor. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. What, what was that, John? Okay. Next. No, no, no. It's, 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 what, what oh, you said? I'm not, I'm not, not a fan. <laughs> well, well, you know, we'll, we'll get to that later on, ladies and gentlemen. So you have to stay to the end of the show all the way through to be able to find out his true feelings on that subject because that cut out. So slide 33. It's extensive. <laughs> well, you know, as we, a, have, his, as we a, have history. Well, as I recall, uh, I think it was during was it during uh, 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 Danny and uh, Doug's show where it's I had to read on an air and like just OK, well, like John was in, in chat and John says, uh, uh, you know, uh, f uh, f fuck Steve Myers. I think I said fuck Steven Myers. Or something. Yes. Yes. Something like that. So we're, we're going to elaborate on that later on because I want to know what the hell's going on with that shit. Um, cause I actually read that on, out on air and I, we could listen to about, about 50,000 people a week. So <laughs> some, some context might be in, in order. Uh, now this is slide 30, th 32. Uh, and yeah, this is, as you can see, it's like from November, 2001, I did, I had made a model with the glass top. And I'd done the ink jets with inside that model. And these were the basic flows of um, where that, I tried to get where the step is. And so I'm, I'm replicating what the inks did because I could not for the life of me figure it out. And these, these absolutely brilliant designers, they, they use, now it's water saturated because it's removes all the gas at the back. So, Water, when you start getting water without air, then it's like being in the ocean and stuff like that or under a lake where elevations don't matter. So it's a, you know, if it's a ceiling flow or a floor flow, it's, it's not affected by gravity. Um, so they actually use the ceiling as one of the surfaces uh, to reflect and guide uh, water across the room. Um, and then they also did a mid-flow, mid which is kind of the purple thing. And that reflection actually did a uh, it did the exact flows that the purple show. Uh, it's extremely complex. And so it's a hydraulic, a hydraulic design, absolutely. And that's, I know anybody can draw lines on a piece of paper. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, he I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. I actually... At the time I did that, I back in 2000, uh, my mother, Aileen Chen, thank you for the donation, uh, and she's always been an amazing supporter and love her to death because this would never have gotten done without her. Um, and she was a principal uh, LA school systems, and one of her students, a gifted student, uh, Johnny Jones, was at MIT in the engineering department and I wrote him by internet when it, internet was still younger and got out to him through her and asked him to find some sort of fluid program which would allow a modeling of the subterranean chamber and so being you know he they have a real bond he was willing to actually listen 
as to as opposed to most people if you uh, universities if you say pyramid the discussion is over um so he actually you know took the question seriously and the end result was uh, we can't model it so i actually had to do ink chats and then draw lines yeah steven draw lines <laughs> Uh, oh my God. <clears throat> I sent him a model. I sent him one of my models back in 1999 um, to help him out to do the subterranean chamber. Um, and I had him hack my AOL and send spam to my people on my address email address list. Thank you very much. And then delete emails that got sent back like, why the fuck are you sending us spam? Uh, yeah, he's one of those guys. It took him years to apologize. Hey, Danny, oh, keep what's on. the official yeah. story from Egyptology on the subchamber? Uh, <laughs> Khufu uh, didn't want to be buried there, so he they said, uh, "Go up. I want a queen's chamber." Or wait, no, he wants another chamber, and then he <laughs> couldn't make up his mind with Changed that either. Mind. And then he then he built the king's chamber, and he's like, "This is good enough." Return on investment, motherfuckers! Return on investment. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, That's a brilliant room. It's, it's a, it's a well long designed. way to go for a chamber pot. Yeah. yeah. Turn. Okay, so this is slide <laughs> thirty-four. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> and this just a mess of lies. What the fuck is going on? This? <laughs> How much DMT did you take before off. you drew this? Now, the, now here's the positive thing. It's it's, it's like a Pollock painting of a New York hotel room. So, <laughs> thank you, Alex. You got that. Kevin Bomber actually did a 3D CGI of the flows, and so with that, you can actually see the flows. He just did that last wow. month. Brilliant work. We worked extensively on getting the model correct. Okay, so in inputs and outputs on these crazy turbulent pictures here it looks like a mess how, how is any of this That's functional the inputs and the output the inputs the yellow that goes straight across to the output and then there's the main flow which goes down through the shaft the uh so this is sort of like a hydraulic shaft. mixing valve of sorts going on here with like three or four ports or i mean presumably the water table is coming up from the bottom and then we're getting some interesting turbulent flow no, rates the, and it's continuing to ascend or water okay comes from okay Th so there's no let, let's let, let's go on to slide 35 then okay now this is so actually a picture of the floor of the subterranean chamber is it not yeah and so that's looking down at the input shaft um and i put ink in the Shaft in the jet going into the room. That was my first one where, you know, May of 2001, where I didn't have the other ports, but it did show the, the reflection off the other the far surface. And then the coolest thing, part of it drops down into the pit, which is that center 45 degree offset, um, which is extremely significant. Uh, but it also shows that the center channel in that step on the right-hand side. And it shows how that water flow that goes through the center channel redirects that purple ink coming across that uh, step face. So I used um, channels to do redirects. It's brilliant. Okay, and uh, I'm uh, getting word that uh, Danny Kerr who has been online with us. And, oh, son of a gun, he signed off. I'm just like, Danny, did you want to sign off between slides and say goodbye to everybody, considering you're, we, we said you were on the show tonight? And uh, he's just like, uh, I'm sorry. I, he, it's like, <laughs> he just signed out. He's bad. So um, uh, Danny sends his absolute best, and uh, uh, next time let me know before you sign off so we can actually give you a proper send-off. So um, that's appreciated. But still, I know, I know he, he's got band stuff to do, and, you know, he's... Uh, an aspiring musician, so and the, his band's actually quite good. If you've if you've ever listened to any okay. any of the music, um, but I digress. Uh, slide thirty six. 
silly question here. What kind of ink were you using for this? Inkjet. It was black. <laughs> I had a lot of it. Old, um, old printer laying around, kind of deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Just you know, for the DIYers at home. Yes. Now this one, I actually started putting uh, little little jets, mm -hmm. uh, drilled the holes inside, and then allowed a, a valves to regulate the ink flowing in. Oh, so and I this this is I really. This is an actual model. This isn't the actual thing. Yeah. Oh my god. Ding ding ding. Oh shit. So it's actually. So that's the actual flows. I'm not just guessing. It, you know. Just draw the lines on a page. Lines on a page. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> well, okay. No, so now the that... most significant thing about this okay. is that if you look at it, they're using the ceiling. They use the ceiling as one of the surfaces to reflect. And that's, you don't necessarily think about that when doing a design. It's a fluid design. You think, you just don't, I did. I never thought of it. And then I did the inks and said, holy cow, genius. Now, my, so my, those, big, my big thing is that, and what I took away from this, is that it was so well designed and so well modeled that I could not actually tell this between <clears throat> your work <laughs> and a picture of the actual thing. So kudos to you on that, um, and even thank uh, you. And now uh, Jared Thompson, uh, Jared, what's up? How 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 is uh, South America? Uh, he is asking: Is there water erosion in the lower chambers, uh, or, or was it or was it cut the out only, like this? You know, the only stuff I can really see, I see the the chipping on the ceiling. I'm there's so much p traffic in and out of there, out of the room that. You can't you can't be conclusive on it. Was it somebody walking here for you know last hundred years? But the ceiling is separate. You can't touch it. Okay. So you don't have people up there chipping away like they do to the Sphinx, etc. And also that yellow arrow you can see that's the jet coming in and going across the room. Uh, you can actually see how they put the the pit offset. So that jet is not interfered with as it goes across the rim. Now, what's so you got a huge close close down in the center of that pit. Now, would the entire room have been filled with water, like uh, up to the brim, or are we talking about just jets of water just shooting back and forth here? No, it's absolutely saturated. Okay, okay. So, like, we're we're talking like swimming pool forces, but like uh, think of like the bottom of a. Um, um, uh, what's it called? Help Hot me out tub. Here. Hot tub, where like you you've got all these flows going back and forth, essentially. Or automatic transmission, uh, like hydraulic dynamics. Part laminar, part turbulent flow in the same space. It's see that was actually a, that's a good question because that was one of the flow questions that that Jack Clay had was he, was he was we were trying to figure out exactly how fast the flows were coming into the room. We we're getting a hundred. 100 feet per second, um, we were both kind of on that. And so 100 feet per second into that room, you know, you do meters per second. But with it being 27 feet across, it would cross the room in a quarter second. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a jet. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. So next one. Next slide. Coming up next week on the Pharaoh's Hot Tub. <laughs> That's just a really nice saturation. It's it's tough to get, you know, July of 02, the digital cameras weren't very good back then. Uh, so that was the best I could do. But you can actually see how it's completely redirected uh, by that step channel, the channel on the right-hand side. Uh, that, that, was, that was confirmation. And that was slide 37. Slide 38. Just another one showing the same thing, but it shows ink going down that uh, the step channel. And also you can see the pit, uh, how it's a 45 degree offset. That's, that is so significant. And nobody addresses it at all. And it took me a while to figure out why they did that. And it has to do with acoustics and uh, tunnels. 
It has to do with the the. Uh, it's exact. That's exactly lined up with the output shaft down to the Nile. So, if you got the exact angle of that, you've got it. You know, it's like a. It's, it's, it's like a ray. You've got a starting point and you've got an angle. And those two things determine um, destinations. You can find the tunnel with that with that with that angle. Okay. It's so important. Yeah. <clears throat> now nobody addressed this. Now slide thirty nine. Um it, various lines on the uh picture. So I'm just gonna just shows where the I'm ink's gonna flip go. this around a little it's, bit. There you go. Okay, now that way you can actually see the ceiling flows cross over. You can see it going over the fin uh, the um, not the the upper fin, but then it hits that wall and then curls down. And what you get is a, a it's a curling vortex. It created two different flow rates within the fins. And then a, um, a curl to it. And you also see the step on that step surface, how you have uh, different directions. Uh, so there's a, a rotation on that step surface. And then if you have a rotation on the step surface in the middle, and you've got water flowing to the right on the upper fins, that shows that the water is going to the rear of the room. And if there's any gases in the room, they are being expelled by that raised divot. Shows purpose. Okay. Now this is slide 40. Like a de-aeration baffle or something? This is, uh, I, I was, 2012, I, I go, you know, that's actually five. 2001, it says at the bottom. 2012. Well, no, I'm, I'm looking John Cabin May 2001, but that could be like the bottom right hand picture, which was okay. So yeah, 2012 for this Fibonacci spiral, Great Pyramid, subterranean chambers, water vortex, perfect vortex outputs through the pit. It's amazing in that it does do that 3D uh, vortex, and it as it crosses the room to the left where that I did the wire twisted wire to give effect, or you all see it. Okay. And mold. Um, that is the path of the water, and it actually misses the jet. It goes in, and then it hits towards the bottom of the room, and then that combines with the uh, rotation of that flow on the floor. And so you actually get a 3D vortex going in there, a Fibonacci. And to the right, that blue is kind of a Man, it was so hard hard to do the pictures. It was uh, a saturation of of that area to really see what it did, and with the better pictures, you could actually see exactly how it crossed over and then rotated. And it's Fibonacci. That's what that room is. Like slick guys. Okay, so this is us. Actually, Patrick Flanagan asked for that picture, for that low, so I sent it to him. Okay, so this is a... Okay, now, now, this is the original design of a, a regular hydraulic pulse generator. Show, shows you kind of how, what they actually are. And that's like from the 1770s or something. It was ages ago. So it's nothing, nothing complex. Um, and and this, this is in France. And what they did, they used a cannonball, and they had a pipe with the, the flow would get the ball rolling up and then slam into that output just through sheer flow. So that was the regulator. And as soon as it shuts, water, because it's basically non-compressive, fluids are non-compressive, essentially, um, it creates a, a shock wave. Now that shock wave goes back towards the feed pipe, Part of that shock wave in that design also goes it up past that up into that upper chamber and past the little one-way valve. And then they used air to uh, regulate and reduce the shock waves. The shock waves are extreme. So that's the original design. 
Um, real world. They've used uh, hydraulic pulse generators. You still make them. That is that. Okay, oh. next one. <clears throat> okay, this is slide 42. Okay, now this is this is the fluid motion, and I'm. This is one I did. Because when I did the the uh, output valve, the uh, wastegate valve, I had to design it in conjunction of with what's at the Giza Plateau. Uh, no cannonballs. Um, you have to be able to replace parts. And so you're going to have to have thrust faces or th thrust surfaces and be able to uh, replace both the valve or the, you know, that the sliding valve and then also the, the surfaces that it strikes and then, of course, the bottoms. Um, and this is the design that an engineer would make if he was doing it in the Giza Plateau. Is what you can do is you have all the thrust going against the left hand side, the impact. Um, you could actually just have uh, have an access through the top, and then put in like granite or basalt lintels or valve seats, uh, and it wouldn't have a lot of thrust against the opening. It's brilliant, it's a brilliant design, and this one actually went underwater. As the output into the Nile. The cool thing about that is that hydraulic pulse generator theory says that they must exit to air. And this one is designed to exit underwater. It works better that way. It took me a long time to erase their BS theories from my brain and do it right. It actually took a ton of observation. So what you see here, as the fluid in the top one, the fluid just goes by this, uh, let's say a, a, a box for, for you know mass, reduce the mass. Let's say it's a box, and as the fluid goes, it's it pushes the box to the end of the uh, output, and then slam shut. That's the first two, just kind of moving the valve through fluid. And then once it shuts, then you actually do get a compression within the fluid, but it's a, a compression wave, shock wave, or water hammer. And it's extreme. Um, when you have instantaneous fluid stoppage, you have extreme shock waves, which most engineering principles say you have to get rid of that. And that's also... Uh, consistent with electrical theory too, uh, with Tesla stuff, energy from vacuum. So you get rid of the shock wave stuff. But anyways, this here, so you've got a shock wave. Now it's going to travel up the pipe, and it travels like it travels just like electricity up wires. I mean, it's very directional and it's very consistent, um, and it can travel a very long ways. Like whales, it's what they can hear the songs. Uh, was it 3,000 or 6,000 miles away? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a great medium, especially when it's focused like that. So the fourth one down, you've got the shock wave, which is the bracket to the right, and then you got the rarefaction wave, which is extremely low pressure. Extremely low pressure actually reverses the fluid in that pipe. And it actually creates suction in the reverse direction, almost like a like a a bounce, uh, and that immediately reopens the valve, and then no water actually exits the valve till that wave comes back down. It's just physics. Okay, so I, I'm just showing it's show, showing this. It's like a sine wave. It's a compression wave with a rarefaction thereafter running up this pipe. So that's showing the valve, and it's a very simple mechanism. Works great. Okay, next one. Slide for the guy with the and the guy with the sperm. It's like <laughs> wants black Russian terriers to reproduce. There we go. Well, this shouldn't be in here. Um, this is supposed to be a different part, but 
This is just Edward Kunkel's book, The Pharaoh's Pump, and what I did was actually X'd out all the shit that's wrong because I had to rethink it all. You can just kind of cruise through that. That was just proof of error <laughs> or shit I deleted. I mean, he was, he was spot on and, you know, hats off. Yeah, he was. All right, next slide. Next slide. Slide 44. There might be, if there's some Pharaoh's pops, you can just kind of keep, keep going forward. It's my notations, rights and wrongs with arrows and underlines. Okay, so next slide. When you start with somebody's work and you assume they're right, it really messes you up well, and stalls and questions all of it. And that's what happened when the pump didn't work. Like, oh, crap. I'm an idiot. <laughs> okay, you just keep going. There'll be a, there's just a few of these pages. All right, so with slide 45, on. more X's. Yeah. This is a jet. There's pole. that air cushion. Yeah, see, that was that was a problem because I was going with air compression chamber, and that was a, a huge part of his theory. And it's wrong. It does. It's a piece of shit with the air, air in it. So that's wrong. But when you start with somebody's work that's wrong and assume it's right, it's tough. I'll keep you can keep going. It was, Right. It's not, it was slide, not a fun time. Slide 46. Fun time. This is this is a lot more annotations and a lot of more X's I'm seeing. Yeah, it, it, it explains that he actually was describing two different pumps. He was describing the lower pump as a construction pump to just pump water by a regular hydraulic pulse, hydraulic ram pumps. And then he starts going off on another one where he's got Oh, stuff up in the uh, fire, up in the upper chambers, which creates a vacuum to allow water to go basically in the wrong direction. And then shoot out one of the shafts of the king's chamber for a giant sprinkler or something. Okay, slide 46. Okay. Slide 46. Probably another one. Yeah, just exit. You can just keep going. Okay, slide 47. If anybody wants to download slide, on their... The, this one's going to be completely x out. Slide 47 is one giant X. So slide 48, more Xs. Slide 49, just, there we go. Okay, now this is my... This shows what's at the bottom of the pit. And this is really important. This is... I, I, I couldn't, like, emphasize how important this is. Is... This tunnel going down the pit, that 45 degree offset, what they did, if you're smart, you would put a reflective elbow, which is different than uh, just a water fluid elbow. And it would, uh, when that shock wave came up, it would reflect off of it. And then instead of the, the wave being all diffracted, you'd still have a, a sound wave or shock wave, which was consistent in frequency. And uh, that shows proof that the what's at the bottom of the pit that they haven't found yet, but also that it's aligned with the exit tunnel. So that, and so the red arrow at the top is like screaming, this points to the waste gate. Nobody's got it yet. And then the bottom one's a fluid elbow. Has, and if you put sound through that, you just get a scattered bunch of it reduces the pressure no the egyptian pressure. turning veins it's a shock wave but you'd have good fluid flow but it's not a it's not a fluid elbow this is not a a, a water dynamic uh, uh aspect it's a it's sound wave. there you go the next one it's, okay so this it's is super slide 50. So it's just a pit, and it just shows exactly where it goes. Okay, we've got just, for everyone in there, we've got one, two, three, four, five, The other six. ones are, are, are insignificant, I think. Okay. Except I think the next one's good. Okay, so this is slide 51. Uh, okay, there it is. There's the compression wave. 
shooting towards the king and queen's chamber and how they're offset to allow the shockwave to hit both. There it is. Okay, and slide 51. That's oh, it. Slide 51 is actor, actually uh -uh. Dr. Jack Lay's uh, hydraulic pulse generator offshore. <laughs> <laughs> and so now he sends shock. Slide 51. There we go. W without yeah. crashing. Yeah. Now, this is so, <clears throat> so important because this is the guy that invented this stuff, came here with Chris Dunn. I invited him and he came here. They said, okay, they, now this has got two different things they got going on. They've got, they got, Increased drilling rates by using the, the hydraulic pulse and the rarefaction wave. Rarefaction, <clears throat> extremely low pressure, and you got 5,000 feet under the water, you've got extremely compressed shale. If you put low pressure there, it sh makes it chip off, just like, just like the ceiling of the Great Pyramid. So what they did here, also, the cool thing that he did because I just typed in hydraulic pulse drainer and came across this, was they could send, they stopped the drilling without taking the drill out, and they'd send pulses down that 5,000 foot shaft, because it's very, it's very con uh, conducive for that, and it sends a shockwave down to the bottom of the drill rig, and they've got the geophones out on the side, and they can tell what's ahead without sending other you know, he's teleformations ad. So, absolutely brilliant. But that is that is the Great Pyramid's line. That's the shockwave going down the line and being transferred to the rock ahead, which would be the Great Pyramid's core. That's it. Okay. And it's a proof of concept. All right. So, so next would be 50... Two? Oh, that's the shaky model I sent to, to uh, Stephen Myers. This is the model. Yeah. This is the model you sent Stephen Myers. Right? Okay, so to help, help him with this model. So slide fifty three is seems to be one of the outside. This shafts. is actually from, it's from the eastern side of the pyramid, and there's this is from Chris Dunn's site, and it's somebody else's pictures but there's shafts there and then there's a metal plate on the right hand side which covers a shaft that goes under the great pyramid so these are things that aren't normally noted um but there's three pictures of the shafts themselves with some garbage in them just for okay, I, this is slide 53 I, I searched and and these very interesting and i'm not sure what to make of it could have been input i I don't know. Okay. It would go into the slide fifty-four. So those those were from uh, GizaPower dot com. Chris Dunn's site. That's a lot Somewhere of garbage on the right hand side there. Yeah, people just, people just toss their shit, and that, that's not cool. Not cool. Mm -hmm. So Fine. there's lots of stuff that's not explored, and or not, or somebody's explored and they put metal plates to cover. And slide 55, or sorry, slide 54. What the hell is this? Oh, that's just the Carolina Bays. All the um, end of the Ice Age impacts or lakes. Comet impact. Randall Carlson. We've had him on a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a just a nice old photo, which before they started messing with it too much. Sorry, and this is, I think that's the end of the... Uh, uh, that's it. Let's see. Oh, that's oh, it. That's it. That's it. It's a, okay, so I'm. Just so that was a that was a slideshow. Well, that that that's the type of show we normally do on here. Uh, let's see, co-host. Uh, right screen. No, go to the best thing. One of the coolest things actually is seeing what Kevin Bomber did on his. There we go. On his CGI and the fluid flows is, he he hit it spot on, and we really worked hard on it. Um, and he isn't done. He's a. Uh, Waited 15 years for somebody to do something. <clears throat> okay, now, now 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 since we've been all through through all of this, and we, we've had a very good explanation of the the general uh, you know inner workings of the pyramid. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I gotta, I, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen with you here just to be able to save some bandwidth. Uh, stop. Okay. There we go. Fantastic. So, uh, what the hell? What the hell is with you and Stephen Meyer, and why is it such beef? Because you know, if 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 you're if you're spouting off in in uh, if I could use that term in in our YouTube chat, well, we've got you know. Uh, uh, Doug, sure. who is a, a good, upstanding gentleman, and he's got his own presentation on. And you hey. say something inflammatory enough to take over the show. Now it's your show, and you're our guest, and we love our guests, no matter who they are. What the hell is going on here? You know, it's it was it, it was an interesting time, um, like 1999, 2000. Now, Stephen Myers, he actually got um, he got the rights to reproduce the Pharaoh's Pump. That book, uh, kind of, which you know, bless, bless your heart, Stephen. And uh, and so he had a site, uh, the Pump Org or something. And the thing is, at 1999 and 2000, I was uh, off grid. And so anytime I wanted to do any sort of research that wasn't in a book or I wanted to put something out, because I'm I'm not a web page guy or don't have sites and stuff basically uh you know i i had beef with him originally because he was like going into my emails and spamming my uh people on my address book not cool um and then i'm I'm a forgiving guy so i i like hey man you know i send him a, a a model actual that one model to try to help out his work. So he was having problems. And then, okay. And then in 2000, I actually get the model working. I, you know, the epiphany moment, last moments of the uh, millennia. And the thing runs on April 3rd of 2000. It just works great. So I, right off the bat. And it completely aligns with Chris Dunn's work. Um, who had suggested that there was a, a machine that's missing from the subterranean chamber, which sent a priming pulse upwards uh, to cause resonation within the king's chamber and to cause it to resonate in conjunction with possibly the other pyramids. And that would cause a coupled oscillator, the pyramid, to the earth itself, to the earth plate for reduction of earthquakes or or tapping into that uh, earth vibration. Uh, so it ran. And then the book is Richard News book, 5-5-2000. So this is April 3rd, 2000. Let's get down to that era. And I'm going, you know, I'd like to get this work out, even though and I'm saying your stuff's wrong and here's how it works. Being cool, being really cool about this stuff, sharing, open share source. And I'm on Giza, I'm on, on the Giza Pyramid, which is a great pyramid, Giza Research Association. So I've got an article on there and I'm you know, getting a little bit established, but it doesn't get out there. It still hasn't got out there. And so he's got the book and a site and all this stuff. And he's fundraising for whatever, put barrels, 55 gallon blue plastic barrels on this garage roof and do a double-sized model and all this shit. You know, um, I said, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's work together. I've got part of it. And between you having a site and access and me, let's just work together and put something out. You know, I'm not, I'm not a greedy sort of guy. I wasn't asking for anything. Just let's work together. No, man, no, I'm just going to go out on my own and continue on my own. And uh, thank you for all the information. Okay, well, you're a prick, okay? Again, I, I should have known. I should have known. Ah, ah, you know, a Norwegian thing. And uh, then August comes around. And he writes me. He says, look, I'm so excited. I've got I got to run my my model of the sub chamber and his model doesn't have output. So it's all just slamming down in there. 
It's a double size, so it's a one to 24, but 24 bottle. And I know how much pressure and what stuff I've blown up on my models. You know, I blew up a, a you know, concrete one and a, and a uh, re reinforced fiberglass uh, epoxy one. You know, they just destroyed them. And you're going, oh my God, this is it's made out of plywood and drywall screws with some Tupperware inserts for the fin step thing. This is this is funny. They go, oh dude, you know, you're saying, gonna really know. you're really gonna have to reinforce that because <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna do something wild and 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 stuff. So you so I just wrote I just had enough and it, he's just writing some really stupid stuff and Okay. So I just said, okay, well, click your ruby red slippers together. <laughs> you know that, that. And uh, he didn't write me for three months. And he said, yeah, it failed. It blew up. And, uh, <laughs> of course it did. What w course. screws and splinters everywhere? Oh, yeah, it was a, it was a disaster. <laughs> you know, you put that, that pressure in there. I wish I had, I, I'm sure he did a video, and it would have been just, it's one of those YouTube viral idiot moments. Well, Steven, to you, you know, it's a, apply evidence. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, now, jump, jumping back here for a second, you mentioned uh, Kevin Balmer, I, I think was the name, and he's working on oh some my God. CGI of uh, fluid flows or something? Or? Yes. Yes. He actually. Um, shout out to Rob Arnold. Um, he, he put us in contact because Kevin Bomber had done the CGI for the Searle, um, uh, generator. Brilliant CGI work. Um, and so I said, well, you know, maybe we could work together on this and put something together and I'll, we'll work together. I'll help you give you all the information and and he's in uh, originally from Boulder, Colorado, but now he's down in southern Mexico, down by uh, Belize, or but down by a pyramid down there. Um, just a really cool, grounded graphics CGI guy. Okay. Um, so we worked on it, and his last one, he's got all the fluid flows in there, correct, on the steps. Uh, it's got the Fibonacci spiral vortex thrown in there. Um, his visions for things to come on that are just, I mean, I'm excited. Is this, it, once you see it in CGI, you know, it's right. That's it's brilliant work. So I'm, I shared that on my, my Facebook and I'm pretty sure I have it on my YouTube. It been trying to share it as much as possible. It's a short clip, and he's doing the upper part. Him and um, uh, Doug are, are working on the model of the upper part. So sharing data, and that started yesterday. So, so this is current stuff, and, and it's really exciting. Well, exciting time. Now, with, with with all the exciting times that are going on, what what is the current projects that you're working on right now? Like what? I see on your Facebook page you've got some crazy. And again, I may be wrong because I, didn't, I I've got this bad habit of not checking the dates on when photos are actually published. Oh. <clears throat> uh, what have you got working on in the woods out there? Oh, oh, completely separate project. Okay. There's a there's a wells. I have a deep well and a shallow well, and and when they put the well and then the power lines in on this property because it's a five acre parcel above the city. Um, they just kind of dug the trench, ended the 220 out uh, line bare, and then there's the wells and kind of did a bunch of some temporary stuff on electrical connections. And so now I just did a com complex, uh, you know, a, a method of, of transferring between two different well inputs and um, being able to split water sources and so those have nothing to do with the the uh, 
Great Pyramid Pub. It's just a project I did. Mm. Did it in a dog crate, but I did it. I actually poured a concrete underneath it, so I dug it out, put the concrete slab, and it's got a drain out of it. It's got actual um, water lines and power lines throughout it. So it's done, you know, it's very professional uh, thing. It just, I, I used an old dog crate. Okay. Now, no, well, no. one one thing I did notice is that your your web page, uh, and uh, yeah. again uh, for for Danny, if you're listening to the show after the fact, um, I can see the correlation. Uh, it's kind of piggybacking off of your uh, one of your passions for your family, which is um, and this is going way off tangent for what we normally do. Uh, you actually breed dogs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, puppies and pyramids. Uh, pu- puppies and well, pyramids. Pu- puppies, pu- the pyramid stuff is just, you just keep throwing money and effort at it. There's nothing, I've never received anything back from it. And I'm not asking for it necessarily. Um, I'd like to do some really cool new stuff, though, using some, you know, electronic fuel injection type things or ink injectors and, and timing and different color inks and actually doing. Uh, Excellent captures, especially when that extreme pulse is going into the room. Is I don't know what it does, and you can theorize all you want, but until you do it, you don't know. And so that's a you know it's not an expensive project, but you know, I can't keep putting the bill. I mean, I just don't have the money. It's on oh, it's, um, it's life. It's life. So I've got black Russian terriers. Um, I have imported dogs. One, my latest sire is from St. Petersburg, came over here at uh, two months of age, which is gorgeous. From a, a wonderful breeder over there. Doesn't put out a lot of dogs, but just a great, intelligent, Russian speaking only person. <laughs> we managed to get two puppies over here a couple of years ago from her, a challenge. So I got a really nice dog from that. No. So I have. Once in a while, and you know, they're rare and kind of expensive dogs, and they guard made by the Russian military, the Red Star Kennel during the Cold War. And they make the Russians, they made their own dog. They're not going to take use a German Shepherd. And so they took Giant Schnauzer, Rottweiler, and aired it out. So yep. you got cool rock temperament. Uh, have you have you, th- have you thought about moving to boxers at any point? Because we're, we're, we're somewhat uh, biased here like, in the end of lore. Too much energy. <clears throat> I don't. I, I I love them, but I don't want them. But they're too so, old for boxers. They're so goddamn adorable, though. <laughs> they are. I agree completely. I I love boxers. <laughs> I had giant schnauzers and a really nice German rod. Um, giant schnauzers, a lot of energy. A lot of terrier. I'm too old for that stuff. Um, these are cool dogs. Now, uh, uh, talking about cool dogs, uh, uh, Doug, you, you've been you've been hanging in the winds for wings for quite some while. Uh, let, let's. Um, uh, w- w- what do you got to add? I to can you? stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just saying, my dog is pretty much a mutt. Uh, German Shepherd on the top, but a Basset down below. Well, I so I, I, I was wants referring to run, more, but he's got. I was referring more towards the entire conversation we had for the last two hours about the pyramids, but th- that's oh, very pyramid. good. Okay. Well, here, okay, here's sorry. here's the thing, and I'm, I'm going to be quite honest. We've got a, a Bram in, in chat right now who is um, our resident shit disturber, and we love Bram. Bram is awesome. He, <laughs> he also wants a, a, a Omicron 4735. Oh, I, I wasn't reading it. Oh, yeah, no, no. Well, here here's the thing. Like, it's a... And, uh, uh, sorry, Juan's just uh, signing off. Uh, Juan, have yourself a wonderful night. Uh, you are a fantastic gentleman. Thank you very much for joining us in. Uh, but uh, Bram is a resident shit disturber. He's been one of our long-time listeners, and he always comes in and asks me to be, like, Chris, be more like Art Bell, and less but like George Norrie. And I'm like, well, dude, I'm, I'm not either one of these guys. And I keep he says it every goddamn show. So I'm like, okay, he's going to join us in on chat at some point. So I'm just going to oh, give you guys a, head, a heads up. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I'm, going, I'm going backwards to the feed, so I, I, I didn't, I don't, I've gotten stuff like that. It's, oh, I, I know, well, here's the thing, like, Bram's... Me and Chris Dunn survived a ton of that shit back in 2000. I just stopped with them, because they're basically, you know, 
they contribute nothing. Well, well, Bram's also somewhat of an engineer, but yeah, he he's a former show host of his own podcast, and we're gonna have him on our uh, for for if a closing. If you contribute nothing, it doesn't matter. Well, I which is have true. Which is true. Bobby Flynn's my life like that. Something something we didn't get into talking about too much. Uh, maybe we can <laughs> yep, on perhaps. another show. Would be the the resonant effect and the acoustic effect. Sure. So, I mean, if it's if you have this giant pulse generator. And it's creating a resonant uh, effect in these upper cavities. Uh, sure. What are they doing with those, you know, resonant sound waves? Uh, how is that affecting anything? That's See, that's that. Now that there, that's <coughs> past my part, and that's up at uh, Doug and Chris Dunn. And there's a. Unfortunately, there was also a. Damn it! Py- pyramid acoustics. My mind's fading. Yeah, it's. it's it's critical. I, I can understand that. See, like, well, we, we could talk about this on the next show. So we go to Doug. Doug. D- D- Doug. 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 Throw him under the curtain. The only thing that I wanted to add along <laughs> here um, was John's work was so impressive. Um, and that was before he actually started to put tools on there, meters, to actually measure the pressure spike that he is he's detecting with his, <laughs> his eight scale. Um I, I do those same calculations in the book, like we talked about on the earlier show, um, and right. the calculations are right in the exact same ballpark of the of the results that he is measuring and then scaling up. I think there's a little bit of friction that may not be being accounted for, um, but it's like the difference between basically 100 atmospheres versus about 300 or so. It's right in the same ballpark. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, yeah, um, it's you have to be able to replicate. Um, your 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 work, and that's that's you know physics proof of concept stuff. It, yeah, uh, and uh, the consistency. Yeah, and the calculations have to back it up at some point because water is water. Water is the same as it was for the builders as it, as it is for us today. Uh, gravity is effectively the same. So the energy we're talking about is is the same for us as it was for the builders. Now, uh, one question we got from YouTube chat, and this is for both of you gentlemen, and this is from. Uh, from Mark Catalano, who is asking, what do you apply to your lives from learning about the ancient Egypt? Oh my, because ancient Egypt covers so many things. Uh, Are we talking dynastic? Are we talking uh, the pre-cataclysm? Jeepers, Egypt is a Greek word, right? So are we well, talking he, the Greek he, well, view of it? Uh, maybe Egypt. that's the best answer. It's just I, I think how it's, I think it's, it's expanded m- my mind with respect to history. Well, I, I, um, that I, what I think it's typically more... write off as... Well, I, I, I think his question is more. That, I, I think his question is more along the lines of, uh, um, uh, you know, like the, the general idea of like, you know, like what do, what do you apply to your lives in, in the general knowledge and uh, you know, like for, for us Freemasons, we apply uh, our working tools to our everyday lives in, in a uh, more of a kind of like a metaphorical stance. So, I, I have a fantastic irrigation pyramid in my backyard. So yeah, like you know, for for, for myself, I I, I re- apply it to my morals. He applies it to his, to redoing his lawn in his backyard. Like how how have you changed your lives about you know, while learning like for the better in terms of uh, while learning about ancient Egypt? Uh, I I can't answer that. No oh, shit. Well, okay. Well, there we go. Damn it, Mark! It's you you broke the show. Purpose wise. Purpose wise. Uh, pur- pur- purpose wise. Purpose wise. Purpose wise. I I see the Great Pyramid as the uh, the trigger for really the search for the prehistory, it's searching for truth. And once you go down that rabbit hole, it's yeah, we're taught some real nonsense. It's uh, prehistory, you know, pre-Diluvian, and start to really search, and it, it does go with the Templars and the Masons, and yeah, I mean, just focusing on the pyramid by itself uh, is a whole subject with without even considering quote ancient Egypt unquote. Shit, we spent four shows just on the water pump theory. You think? Sure, there we, you go. We, we could do yeah. this show like for the next two years just on the pyramid itself if we wanted easily. to. Easily, easily. Yeah. I haven't even gotten to Schwaller. True enough. No. Um, okay. He's done so much. He did so much. All right. Okay, well... Change your... <laughs> this guy's a drunk. 
Yeah, I know. He's you know Br- Bram's awesome. The, the, again, he's he's our resident shit disturber. We love him because he does. Okay. And for for him, it's about the show. It's not it's not that he's being mean mean spirited. It's just oh, him playing up to the crowd. And uh, he, yeah. he <laughs> I swear to God, he's, he's a heckler. No, on, honestly, he's, he's a really a really not like Bram's actually really not. He's gonna kill me for saying this. He's actually a really fucking nice guy. And uh, he's a heckler. He, he's a heckler, yes. He, he is a professional heckler, but he's a really nice guy. And um, we're going to have him on the show just because he probably had a few, and that's part of our like joke-closing segment. We don't have any sandwich updates, I think, just because he talks Japanese. It's quite awesome. Um, <laughs> so, John, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on the show. Did you have anything else to add? Oh, my goodness. Um, I see, you know, what I see happening from this point on is not necessarily my doing work um, it's just that there's other people that are going to keep adding uh, pieces to the puzzle I, I just did one part and it's it's the motor underneath it and it's a pulse generator and so here's the running pulse generator and, and it's kind of like making a V8 motor or something once you have a motor you got to other people are going to design around it. And so this is the you know, absolute proof of concept. It's all there. It's, it's been reproduced. It's you know, logical. It's, it's, not even, it's not even a stretch of imagination because all the stuff's there. And it runs beautifully. You don't need an opinion if you can model it, right? Hell no. That's it. <clears throat> So there, I'm excited to see what comes after this. Is what it is, awesome. because you got you got Doug's work, Chris's work, uh, Joe Parr. He passed. His work was phenomenal. Um, you know, all these brilliant people. So let's see what happens next. I just did my part and shared it. Fantastic, awesome. Uh, and you know, we. Uh, <laughs> Well, hell, we we had a fantastic journey. It was kind of a lead up to have you on the show because I know we had uh, Spencer Cross, we had uh, um, Stephen, yeah. we had uh, Doug and uh, Danny, and now we've had you. And uh, we've all been, you know, become friends of the show, or they've all become friends of the show. And uh, we would like to invite you back to the Den of Lore anytime you want, whether it's just to be able to say hi or just have a glass of scotch or talk about your new dogs, please do not hesitate to come by because we love John Cabin because John Cabin is the shit. Chris was saying before the show Woo! that he had, he, we <laughs> needed to get you to model <laughs> the pyramids, but then we were going to inject shit. scotch into it instead of water oh, fuck, and then model that in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> this, is, this is how we do this show. Uh, so look, look, it should work. Look, sure. <laughs> now, now this... I want to show you something. This is this is a check valve. Yep. That was the wastegate valve that that Chris brought. He bought here. He said, "Let's do a model." As Chris done with the with the check valve. Okay. So he bought it. And he said, "Well, it'll work. It's kind of a turd of a valve because I've got a better one." So we took one, and you run them backwards. So instead of opening water going this this way. You have water going this way, okay? naturally in closed position, closed position. So that's how it works. But then I said, well, what you got to do is flip the valve open mm-hmm. or flip it. So it naturally has a natural gravitational spring. See, it's observed some things under the plateau. And we modeled them when he was here. And, you know, you got to humor the guy. <laughs> He's awesome. And anyway, so we did it, and this ran, and, and so that's the valve that we used for a while. And then this is the valve that is, I had to make it, I used a very light spring in it uh, to keep it open, um, just because I have the valve pointing down and a gravitational effect would be a gravity drop of this, this here slider. But this is, this is a, a round reproduction or representation of that square valve that would be a Giza. So what I did, I truly made as close as possible the valve that would be there. And had to make it heavy duty enough to 
it's had four million pulses or mm-hmm. something. That's a lot of impacts. Yeah. So maybe slider and and anyways, this is from 2001 because I was originally had ports. I made ports. I ground ports on the side because I had the concept that it exited to air. And so what I made was uh, these are like two-stroke ports. So two-stroke motorcycles. So you have ports. For back in the day, I used to port motorcycles. And so I, I actually made it so the water would dump out these ports. And so at that point, it's exiting to air because it's not full of water. Okay. So that was concept. So I'm following the basic theory of a hydraulic pulse generator. Nice. But I had a vertical position. And then I was sitting there watching it so you gotta you know watch nature you know chopper observe nature and so i watched it and what i saw it shocked the not shocked me shocked the shit out of me okay so i watched it and i didn't realize that right after the shock even though there's water all the way up to the to the um, reservoir that it immediately reopened, even though there's all the pressure, we think there'd be pressure. So then it, I go, oh my God, it's the, uh, it's the uh, rarefaction wave that's opening the valve. So it's like, it was one of those, oh my God moments. And then later on, I got horizontal because it's, if rarefaction is opening it, that could be underwater. Now, <clears throat> speaking of horizontal, um, that just that just tells everything. That is awesome. Yes. Um, speaking of horizontal, I know that you've been up for quite some time. I know it's uh, uh, you know late out there, it's late out here and out east, and late out there out west. Uh, you know, you're a family guy, so we would are. <laughs> Well, we call like, it an adios. Well, we're going to call it an adios and say thank you very much for having a fantastic night. We're we're going to send you the link whenever the audio show comes up. And then I, the thing is, I really want to get Bram on the show because I got to put him on the uh, the hot seat. And uh, okay. as uh, as we told him, and uh, again, I don't want to sub- subject you to Bram, but I wanted people to say, and as I told him in chat, prepare your ass. You're on the hot seat next. So, unless you want to hang around for that, do you want to hang around for that? Moi. No, I uh, just uh, I've in, I've encountered this stuff. I, I just <laughs> give me the valves, not the hecklers. I just don't Good give enough. a Good. shit. I don't want to waste my time with crap. <laughs> exactly, I've exactly. Had, it's part it's part of the entertainment of the show. So uh, we 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 don't okay. we, we we know you don't have time, but still, <laughs> I'm not I'm not interested. Exactly, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> It's like, it's, but, I guess it's fine if for Monty Python British humor shit and oh, yeah. Chris Dunn has that humor by the way and he's very British humor and he's very funny but it's very dry and I'm like I don't understand it <laughs> there we go awesome <laughs> John have yourself a wonderful night have yourself a good weekend thank you for all your efforts in building those models and sharing them with us well, thanks, for, thanks for presenting it well because most people don't. It's only been pre- presented a couple times. Well, yeah, this is what the show's about. And then last week, and then a, a blip on Ancient Aliens. Thanks to Chris. He, he the producer, and said, you need, you need to get your stuff out there. Well, there you go. John Cabin, thank you Chris. very much. Wonderful. All right. Later. Later. <clears throat> Doug, please do stay on the line, because th- this could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, John, have Kevin, at it. Have yourself a good night. Later. <laughs> the good night. camera's off. There we go, John, Kevin, everybody. So uh, I'm just gonna add. Uh, where's Bram? 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 There's Bram Michaels. There we go, Bram. And I'm just gonna add Doug to this because Doug might be able to add some. Oh, Doug's already offline. He left immediately. Holy shit! There we go, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> is Bram going to answer? Ladies and gentlemen. Should we start the outro music now? Well, I'm, I'm just going to put on the uh, the, the sandwich. Uh, <clears throat> mm-hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Doug Cadman. <laughs> Sorry, that was John Cadman. 
on the show, and we were waiting for Bram to come on, and I, I've, I've ringed him on uh, on Skype. Is he with us? Bram? Bram, are you there? So, um, that... Uh, <laughs> Alex, what did you take away from the show? From, with, with, uh... Well, I'm really glad that someone's actually taken some time to physically model the <clears throat> fluid dynamics of it. Well, I, like my, my whole thing is I want to be able to get behind the hard science and realize what the differences were between... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bram Michelson. Thank hey, you very much for joining on the show. <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> I am very well. Um, I was just listening to the guy that... Uh, you are talking to, and I would very much like to engage him in conversation, but he seemed to skittered away. I'm very sir. Well, let, 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 let me put you on a hold for one second. Hello. 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 That's DK. Sir. This is insanity. <laughs> this is insanity. You know, uh, 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 DK, give me one second. Give me one second. Hang, hang up there. There we go. Oh, no worries. No worries. And we're back. And we're back with Bram. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> d d d d Danny Kerr was uh, at band practice. I'm gonna have to. Can, can you like Facebook him and just say like, hold on for a second? Um, uh, Bram, are you there? Yo. Okay, so. Uh, Bram, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the show. It's been uh, like about 30 episodes since we had you on last. It's and been a while, yes. Sir. It, we have our our fun music for you, so um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> th this is our this is our close usually our closing segment, and uh, you know I can understand that you are an engineer that uh, John Cadman's an engineer, and that you have some certain differences with John Cadman, and your um, uh, utterances in our chat can be quite entertaining sometimes. 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 And well, as a resident shit disturber, and usually we're, we're hoping, <laughs> we're, we're hoping that, um, you know, we, we said, like, we'll bring on the show every now and again, when you've had a couple, and, Thank like, you. I could tell when you've had a couple in, in chat when you start getting very belligerent. <laughs> I try. I mean, like, I see shit where it c comes up, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Pardon okay. me? Well, Bram, I, 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 okay, so, well, well for, first of all, I, I do have to say is that your your use of FFS, FFS um, <laughs> has, has a defu uh, has a, uh, befuddled me for quite a few weeks until I realized what the what the hell you were talking about. What the fuck? Yeah, exactly. Yes, um, yes, exactly. Uh, although if you, if you are if about? if you are going to swear, I, I would please ask uh, only in the in the proper old Japanese. Uh, um, uh, you know, in, old Japanese. Okay. In, in Japanese. Oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bram. So, um, what what is your expert take on the uh, pyramid pump, and why are you so opposed to it? Okay, like as an engineer and somebody who is is familiar with the the way that force and balance works, like. I don't understand the way that the, the the I don't understand the way that okay let me get my thoughts straight here okay there's one way that the uh, the pyramid has been created within like a well oh, for fuck's sakes is it the music yeah. Is the music yeah, it's the music. It's, it's the music. Yes. <laughs> well, this is the beautiful part about the music. This is the closing segment music. Yeah. We, we, we played this music for you, Bram. Balance. Balance. We're balance. getting a balance. 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 It's, it's the way that like, the, uh, like the, the, there's one guy that was a French dude that said that the, the, the pyramid was actually a poured structure. That the way that a uh, that somebody would in a modern time would create a s I'm just way too drunk for this. No, I'm not going to do this. All right, that's awesome. You know, Fair and enough. we we can understand that. Um Bram, thank you very much. So let, let's uh 
Yeah, you roll the dice. Roll, roll the dice and see what happens. Let, let's. Uh, I know Danny's been waiting in the wings, so let, let's let's bring him in. Holy shit! We got that re- live outro music tonight. We, we have live outro music. Yeah, Dan, Danny Kerr. Danny Kerr, ladies and gentlemen. Danny. Danny. He's just playing. Danny. I like it. Best best live outro music we've ever had. Danny. Well, he, you, he can't talk and like. Well, you know, like Danny has been trying to try, trying to get us uh, to. Uh, outro music. I think so. It's very good, Danny. I mean, it's better than sandwich music. Well, no, I thought the sandwich music was hilarious. <clears throat> Danny. He's not gonna pick up. I'm okay, just gonna yeah. have to call it a show. <laughs> Let's call it a show. Uh. So I'm gonna put the piano music back on because it's I fucking awesome. We just do a slow fade on the guitar. <laughs> okay, so we had uh, uh, one guest hang up on us because we invited him on. That was the whole point of the show. The whole point of like the or so, bring. Sorry, we'll bring him on again later. Well, I, well, like Bram for now. I think he's done for the night. Thank, thankfully. Um, one night we're gonna have to have like an all guest show. Like an all like uh, chat guest. Exactly. So, l- ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank you very much for joining the Den of Lore uh, for this evening with uh, John Cabin, for all of the uh, d- uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are in chat and listening around the world right now live. Um, that is the show, I guess. Uh, with with Danny, he's been he's jamming hard and just like picked up and to listen to this shit. Just pocket oh, dial good. like the Den of Lore. Oh, show. It's a possibility. Um, so next week on the show. Uh, we have a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman, and so uh, it, it's um, uh, you know, my God in heaven! I actually forgot who we have on the show next week. This is this is this is the amount of stuff we've been dealing Stay with. Stay tuned for this episode. This is why they need <clears throat> to subscribe, so they don't even need okay. to know. They're just going to tune in <laughs> next week. We we have uh, Dr. Gerald R. Uh, Dickens. Uh, we're going to be talking about the P E T M. Uh, now you're probably wondering what the PETM is. It's not Scotch peat. That's N- for sure. No, it, it's not. It is uh, it's the uh, Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. This is like our hard science month. So we're going to be well, it's, talking about well, it, the it's year. 60, Sixty-five thousand. Uh, sorry, sixty-five million years ago. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the Earth basically went through its largest warming it's period. It's really since hard to radiocarbon date a volcano. Well, okay. The, the man also like discovered the eighth continent in Zealandia. So we're gonna be talking a bit about that. Okay. And uh, the, sounds interesting. Oh no! Well, like he okay. Well, he's on conference right now, and um, you know we we're gonna have him this week, but uh, cool. next week is going to be fucking hard ass science. We're gonna have another presentation, another lecture, and it's gonna be absolutely fucking awesome. This is our new like pre outro outro song. Like, I swear to God, like our our ending segment song is now this. From now on, I swear. <laughs> For, for a month, you have to like switch it up every month. And uh, well, okay. Here's the, like with with uh, uh, Doctor Dickens, his whole thing is that the model from 65 million years ago is could be potentially equal to what we're going going to go through in you know uh, several hundred years from now. Um, now, if this turns, and I, I talked to him beforehand. I'm like, well, we're not turning this political. We don't talk politics in the show. Like, and, and because the whole idea of uh, global warming is now politicized, it's. Um, kind of bullshit but mm-hmm. uh he said he's just gonna be doing hard facts and hard data and i talked to randall carlson i got some data from him and i'm using his stuff to source just in case we have any issues with politics but uh, uh you know dr dickens seems to be really fucking cool on this shit so i think we're i think we're gonna have a good uh, a good show next week with some hard science and you know some some natural uh, phenomena phenomena of uh, global warming and climate change so, uh, you, but be stewards of the earth, full of God, people. Recycle, don't pollute, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't be an asshole to to Mother Earth because uh, she can be a bitch right back, which is uh, evident with the fact that we have had no fucking real spring weather. Maybe one day, all of April. It's oh my god, it's so depressing. Anyway, um, 
next, that is next, uh, going to be next Friday, same time, uh, 8.30 p.m. It's already in our uh, YouTube channel, so uh, you can uh, uh, get us on with that and uh, set your reminders now. And yeah, that would be it. So uh, what, what should we play for the outro music? We've got, um, what did we play last week? Just play the sandwich music until you're sick. Okay, good enough. <laughs> so we have to switch next month. Okay, good enough. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Have yourselves a wonderful evening. You guys all rock. We love you all. And uh, thank you for listening to The Dead of Lore. I'm going to have to go to the deli and pick up some pastrami. <laughs> oh, I know. Get me a piano. Huh?